All right, good morning, everyone. It is eight o'clock on Monday, June 13th, our next to last day here of the June council meeting. And before we get started, I'll turn to Executive Director Merrick Burden. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman, council members, and everyone listening online. A um, Couple of announcements this morning. One, um, of course, we do have a full agenda with several topics, um, should be an interesting day. Um, let's see, an update on our COVID situation. We do have one more positive case. If you've been in close contact, you should have been um, uh, contacted by now. Um, and then if you are one of those people, please wear a mask. Um, that's the end of my morning comments, Mr. Chairman. All right, without uh, further ado, we'll get started on our last ground fish items and um, Vice Chair Brad Pettinger has the honor of presiding over those. Thank you, Chair Gromick, and uh, good morning, everyone. We are at F6. Um, we've heard the reports, we've had our public comment, and so with that, I'll open the floor for a discussion. So who would like to start us off? Uh, my apologies, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, good morning, Council. Yes, as uh, you mentioned there, Mr. Vice Chair, we have we went through all the reports. Uh, we heard public comment. And now we are set for Council discussion as well as uh, 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 addressing the various actions that are under this agenda item. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Todd. Okay. We go to a short recess. Just joking. <laughs> Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I just want to start off this discussion by acknowledging all the work and preparation that has set us up for this, uh, considering this action here this morning. We have a number of GMT reports and CDFW reports and lots of reports in general from NIMS and all of the different agencies. And so I just really want to acknowledge that and thank um, the GMT for the item action item checklist that really helps me keep on top of all of the moving pieces within this item. So I just want to acknowledge that. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. I would like to acknowledge that uh, this is John DeVore's last spec cycle and he's been through many of them. And uh, thank you, John, for for being there all these years and uh, your wife's wise counsel. So, okay, Heather, Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. Um, I, I wanna echo what, um, what Jessica said about the, um, the good work of the, the GMT, the SSC, the GAP, the good input from stakeholders as we, worked through harvest specifications starting um, last fall. Um, we did uh, took a lot of action in April with a lot of really helpful um, input. And um, I think that's going to help us um, with our action today. Thank you, Heather. OK. Well, since we don't see any more discussion, um, I would see, is, does anybody have any motions planned? <laughs> well, that's going to be odd if we... <laughs> Todd, did you have something? I'm sorry, no, Mr. Vice Chair, I guess I'm just fidgeting over here and it looked like okay. I was saying something. All right. All right. I think we're just waiting for motions to come through cyberspace or Mr. Vice Chair. Actually, I'll tell you, who's sitting in the California seat, CDFW? I don't see, is Marcy on? Marcy, oh, she, goes online. Okay, okay, very good. Sorry, Marcy. Okay.
Okay, we'll, we'll just pause for a little bit here. So somebody would give me the high sign when they're ready. So. Okay, um, I guess the motions are being sent, so we're um, standby that comes through. Um, and Marcy, um, is it possible to get a mic check to make sure you're ready to go? Yes, can you hear me? Um, we can. Excellent. Good okay. morning. Good morning. Okay. And uh, Sandra, I believe you have a CDFW motion? She's she's nodding her head yes. So. All righty. Not seeing it on the screen. Well, they're working on it. So. Okay. Is that hers? Okay. All righty. I move that for item one, the harvest specifications, adopt the following. For Quillback Rockfish off California, option two, ABC is greater than ACL, SPR harvest rate of 0.55 and a P star of 0.45. For Copper Rockfish off California, Adopt the no action alternative, which is to apply the default harvest control rule 4010 adjustment to each assessment area ABC. Then moving to item two, which is area management of the ex of the action island item checklist, replace the language of the GMT recommendation with the following. Adopt the following proposed updated waypoints and modifications described in F4A Supplemental CDFW Report 5, April 2022, and E5A, Supplemental CDFW Report 1, November 2021, as recommended to address CDFW enforcement requests, better align coordinates with the depth contours as suggested by industry, and to eliminate crossovers. Do not include new proposed waypoints around islands, banks, and high spots within the Calcod conservation areas from E5A Supplemental CDFW 1, November 2021, 
which will be considered in the non control management measures agenda item. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Is the uh, language on the screen accurate? Yes, it is. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Looking for a second. Second by uh, Chair Grolnick. Please speak to your motion, Marcy. Yeah, thank you. Um, item one, um, these were carryover <clears throat> harvest specifications that we could not uh, bring to finality at the April meeting. These are the last two uh, bits of the specifications that needed addressing. Um, we left the April meeting with some questions about how we best calculate um, the ACL uh, contributions to the minor nearshore complexes north and south of 4010. Um, so a fair amount of work um, was done by GMT and uh, Science Center staff to um, examine uh, the right application of um, the calculations. Um, those are described uh, thoroughly in the, the GMT report as well as a supplemental attachment from NIMS um, outlining uh, corrections that were made uh, since the April meeting. Um, so by um, finalizing the, speci the, the specifications, again, it allows us to um, finalize the um, minor nearshore ACLs north and south. Uh, moving to item two, the area management um, item. There have been a number of waypoint modifications that have been proposed by CFW uh, going all the way back to uh, November 2021. Um, we've proposed these waypoint modifications to accomplish a number of objectives. Um, the department collects them over the biennium from industry, from enforcement, um, and elsewhere to um, propose cleanups to the waypoints in the biennial specifications process. Um, there's a little bit of confusion in the sense that in the report we brought uh, in November of 2021, we also proposed adding a number of waypoints around islands and high spots in the cow cod conservation areas. And uh, we're still proposing those modifications, but now they uh, rightfully fit in our non trawl area management uh, agenda item that is um, being taken up in a, a, a different um, timeline. Um, but when we had submitted that report originally, it wasn't clear um, whether those waypoint adjustments would be included in the specs or in the um, the package that would include the Calcutt area repeal. So the motion uh, is just aimed to clarify that for the specifications, uh, we're only proposing um, the adoption of waypoints needed to address uh, enforcement concerns um, and the industry requests for areas outside the Calcutt conservation areas and to eliminate crossovers of existing waypoints. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Questions for the motion maker? Discussion on the motion? Uh, Todd? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Mr. Remco, I just wanted to confirm that in your motion here for copper rockfish that you are also acknowledging that uh, the corrections to the estimated apportionment for that particular species in California north and south of 4010 is, uh, I guess, Meant, or is, is part of that uh, that language. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I just didn't have the attachment number handy, but I did speak to um, the correction uh, that was prepared and submitted uh, in the briefing book. And the GMT's recommendation here um, does pick up um, that correction. So this this item reflects the, the GMT's recommendation um, fully. Thank you very much, Ms. Uremko. Uh, I appreciate that answer. Okay. Thank you, Todd. Okay. I don't see any hands, so I'm going to call for the motion. Um, 
All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. All right. Should we have another one up here shortly? Oh, Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair Penger. Um, I do have a motion um, for this agenda item. I'm hoping Sandra has it. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. I move that the council adopt the five exempted fishing permits included under agenda item F6, June 2022, attachments four through eight, and except for action items one and two, the bolded recommendations summarized by the GMT in agenda item F6A, supplemental GMT report three, appendix two, as the final preferred alternatives for 2023 and 2024. These recommendations include adopting the EFPs with their associated set-asides, the set-asides for treaty fisheries and the final preferred alternatives for management measures, which includes allocations, set-asides, trip limits, bag limits, and seasons. Okay, thank you, Heather. Is the language accurate on the screen? Yes. Very good. For a second, seconded by Butch Smith. Thank you, Butch. Um, speak to your motion, Heather, please. So, um, as I, I mentioned at the start of this agenda item, um, many of these actions included in this motion um, adopt the um, PPA as the FPA. Uh, we heard um, from from the the GMT, the GAP the SSC, the public in April that um, provided very strong rationale for, for taking those actions. And uh, I, so I won't go into those in too much detail. I, I will say that, um, you know, specific to Canary, we talked about that a little bit uh, when this agenda item was on the floor on Saturday. Um, I know we took a close look at um, Canary Rockfish relative to um, the two-year trial, non-trial allocations. Um, WDFW also provided a report in March that provided more detail on uh, what that attainment looks like for the Washington Recreational Fishery. Um, in looking ahead to 23, 20, 23 and 2024, um, we expect to see, see continued increase in canary catch, but um, it still seems unlikely that the non-trial sector will exceed the non-trial allocation. Um, and we expect that the chance of exceeding the Canary Rockfish ACL um, will remain low. Um, and so for that reason, are proposing any formal changes to those allocations for 2023 and 2024. Um, this action does um, include the two year um, Trial and non-trial allocations, Amendment 21 allocations, harvest guidelines, and state shares for stocks in a complex. Um, I want to speak to um, action item 12F and the amendment to extend the primary sablefish season date uh, from October 31 to December 31. Um, we think this is an action that was identified um, by the fixed gear program review, it's moving forward through the specs package. Um, this will uh, will help the fixed gear um, primary tier um, participants achieve, achieve their um, stable fish attainment overall, provide economic benefits to that sector and fishing communities. Um, Agenda action item 12F, which is the amendment to correct the FMP language for block area closures is included in this action. Uh, this just aligns um, the definition of block area closures in federal regulations. 
relative to action item 12J, the block area closures for groundfish mitigation, um, the GMT followed up with their complete analysis under this agenda item at this meeting. Um, this allows um, both midwater and bottom trawl gears um, to be used for, for the purposes of groundfish mitigation. Um, I note the input from the gap still highlights that the voluntary industry actions um, are very an efficient way to respond to um, incidental catch of non-target species, including spiny dogfish. And um, so appreciate that, um, that, that that tool will be in place as well. Um, this motion does include um, the recommendation for the Washington Recreational Fishery which includes bag limits, seasons, um, et cetera. This also um, just adopts the PPA that we brought forward in April as the FPA. Um, it includes no retention for copper quillback and vermilion rockfish um, in the months of May, June, and July. Um, I think that covers the issues I wanted to talk about in this, thank you. Um, Jessica. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I would just like to add some justification around some of the other items in this motion. Okay. okay. Thank you. So under this for action, action item 12E, non-bottom contact hook and line gear allowance in the non-trawl RCA, uh, the GMT was recommending revising the proposal to include new gear definitions as outlined in the NIMS report one from June, which adds that specificity that was discussed in April 2022 at the council meeting in the gear definition. And I, I appreciate the inclusion of these specifications based on the feedback from the EC, the GAP, um, and EFP directors. This um, motion also includes action item 17, was, which is the Oregon Recreational and the GMT here again um, is recommending adopting the PPA as the FPA for Oregon Recreational Groundfish Fishery for the 2023-2024 seasons as outlined in uh, our ODFW report from April of 2022. ODFW is recommending the federal regulations for 2023-2024 Oregon Recreational Groundfish Fishery remain the same as 2022-2023 with the exception of allowing that long leader gear fishing with all depth halibut fishing that would otherwise be legal ground fish with all depth halibut, including sablefish, uh, Pacific cod and other flatfish. So just as a reminder, um, for 2023 and 2024, ODFW would be recommending allowing that additional opportunity for anglers participating in the all depth halibut fishery, analysis of this long leader gear uh, fishery indicated that additional effort would not be expected, nor would there be additional impacts to yellow eye, rockfish, Chinook salmon, or coho, and no new trips would be occurring, or no new trips would be occurring. English would just have more opportunities on the trips they're already taking. And at ODFW, we will be working with our enforcement partners to set up those regulations so that they can be enforced. And while the federal regulations being recommended um, as FPA here are the same as the previous cycle, ODFW intends to continue to manage the recreational fishery more precautionary via state regulations in our Oregon administrative rules. This could include lower bag limits, sub bag limits, depth restrictions. Um, the state process is able to react in a very in a timely manner to what is happening in season in the fishery and allowing for the fishery to stay within harvest limits as well as maximizing those opportunities for anglers. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, Todd? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, this question goes to the uh, to Ms. Hall, um, and it might be answered by Mr. Remco here shortly. But um, as the council will recall, Dan Platt offered, uh, I guess he would like to extend his particular EFP, and he offered that uh, acknowledgement during his public testimony, but it does not submitted in writing. So this extension was for north of 4010 and as well as south of 40 or 3427. Um, so if the council could acknowledge that that is also part of this particular motion, um, it would be a, a good idea. Thank you. Heather? Thank you. Yes, it is. Okay. 
Very good. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Yep. Thank you, Todd. Okay. Uh, discussion? Um, Phil Anderson? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I just wanted to speak to the aspect of the motion dealing with short belly rockfish. Um, uh, the action builds on the council's previous actions to increase protection for short belly rockfish, recognizing the importance the species has in the health of the California current ecosystem. Short belly rockfish are found in waters extending from Baja California to British Columbia. They are one of the most abundant rock fishes in the California current ecosystem and are a key forage fish for many fish, birds, and marine mammal species. The action, the need for the action here is to is to formalize within the ground fish FMP language that requires the council to review short belly rockfish mortality if the annual fishery related mortality is projected to meet or exceed 2,000 metric tons. Since 2011, total annual mortality of short belly rockfish in the West Coast fisheries has ranged between seven and 667 metric tons. So don't anticipate the 2000 metric ton uh, threshold to be a burden on fisheries that have incidental catches of short belly rockfish. Uh, the FMP um, amendment would also support the council's recent action to designate short belly rockfish in our ecosystem component species within the West Coast ground fish fishery management plan, recognizes it, recognizing its importance as forage in the California current ecosystem. I think this action it, uh, is, is a prudent one and it is proactive in protecting an important forage fish species I want to emphasize there is no immediate concern relative to the establishment of a directed fishery on short belly rockfish and that the existing trawl fishery that catches short belly rockfishes by catch has proactively taken actions voluntarily to avoid the species and has been very responsive to the council's concern regarding avoidance of the species. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to speak to the rationale for that component of the motion. Thank you, Phil. Further discussion? Joe Oman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And I'd like to say thanks to uh, Heather for the motion. Uh, I would like to provide the following comments in support of the treaty set aside portion under this motion. The council supported the draft travel set aside as shown in item E5A supplemental travel report to November 2021 in November and adopted it as the PPA in April. The coastal tribes have requested no further adjustments to set asides, harvest guidelines, and allocations after the initial request at the November council meeting. Travel set-asides, harvest guidelines, and allocations are consistent with the set-asides requested for the 2021 to 2022 biennium, with the exception of Pacific Ocean perch and dark blotched rockfish. The requested changes from the current biennium are adjustment from 9.2 metric tons to 130 metric tons for Pacific Ocean perch and 0.2 metric tons to 5 metric tons for dark blotched rockfish. Both of these changes are not expected to have adverse effects to non-treaty fisheries, but will provide additional opportunity within the tribal fisheries. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Okay, further discussion? All right, I'm gonna call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. I believe we have one more motion. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. I move that the council adopt the recommended changes and corrections to the Pacific Groundfish Fishery Management Plan 
as described in agenda item F6, attachment nine, June, 2022. Thank you, Heather. Is the uh, language accurate on the screen? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Second, seconded by Phil Anderson. Thank you, Phil. Uh, please speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, this is pretty straightforward. I think uh, the motion here, just, just make sure that those corrections to uh, the FMP are made. Uh, there's some corrections, but there's also some uh, language in there that um, adopts the motion and the actions that were just taken under the previous motion. So, thank you. Wonderful. Okay, discussion on the motion or questions for the motion maker? Seeing that, I'm going to call for the question on that one too. So, all right. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, any other further motions to be made? Okay. Todd, I'll, this is the fastest four hours ever, but <laughs> how, how are we doing? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, looking at this particular agenda item, uh, you have obviously heard all the reports, yes, um, a couple days ago, as well as public testimony. You have had three motions here that have, in my opinion, adequately addressed all of the uh, action items under this agenda item. I would look, obviously, to my NIMPS counterparts and my, my staff counterparts if they have any questions or no. Um, so I would say, at least based on what I've seen, this has been a really efficient uh, specs item. I appreciate that. Yes, sir. Well, we can't close it out yet. I'm, I'm no. sorry, I missed uh, Marcy's hand up. So uh, yes. just, just pause, pause that. Yes, sir. So, Marcy. Hey, thank you. Uh, I apologize. I had a technical difficulty there, and I wasn't able to speak to um, the motions that Heather brought, but I, I just wanted to chime in if I might just for a minute to say, um, you know, uh, regarding the Emily Platt EFP and the uh, expanded range extension, um, I'm not sure if you covered this since I, um, I blipped out there, but um, regarding the uh, use of trip limits uh, for those participants that will be uh, engaging in the EFP north of 4010, to the uh, Oregon Washington border um, and that they would be uh, managed uh, to the yellow eye non trawl commercial ACT. Um, that that work took place um, this week to develop that plan so that um, we didn't need to deal with set asides for that EFP um, in a way that would um, keep things on track. Um, just want to thank everyone that came together and came up with that plan. Um, and also speaking to the range extensions south of Point Conception, um, those set asides do exist for south of 4010, so they're available for new participants that might engage uh, in activities south of um, south of Conception. Um, we're excited about this. Uh, we think that testing the use of bait using the already authorized gear um, is going to give us some, some really good scientific information to help inform us as to whether um, the gear can be fished um, with bait, which might be more effective uh, at catching fish than, than just um, shrimp flies or jigs. And so we, we look forward to um, the work. We wanna thank uh, Dan Platt for um, requesting um, continuation of the EFP and the modifications. Um, and I know that there are um, a number of new uh, interested participants um, that are willing to give this a try. So I just, I want to thank um, council staff and NIMS for their hard work uh, behind the scenes on this since April. It was kind of a late breaking development once we realized that um, the 12 E item, um, which is, you know, again, such a landmark event that we're finally <laughs> getting the Emily Platt, uh, EFP, the original, uh, EFP, the original gear configurations into regulation. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that and appreciate, um, the work that's gone on. And I, I really think we're, we're going to learn a lot from, from the ongoing study. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. 
Um, Todd? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I believe now that this uh, agenda item has been adequately addressed. And if I may, I would really, on behalf of staff and uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service team that worked on this particular item, I'd uh, like to acknowledge the GMT who had largely never met in person um, throughout this entire process, but yet were able to deliver a, in my opinion, a stellar product for the council to review. So thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Don. Yeah, you expect to tell you the cycle's always tough and it just uh, it went so smoothly here on the, on the final day here of this item. It um, just shows you just all the work, good work that was put into that. So thanks to everyone involved. It's just, uh, it was pretty tough, for, especially tough for some folks. So, okay, with that, I'll take care of F6 and we will go into F7. And I guess then we'll wait to, uh... oh, Keely? Would we have a five minute break to switch seats? I'm sorry? Could we have a five minute break to switch seats? We can. So, yeah. Okay, we'll break for five minutes.
Okay, we're back in session. I believe uh, I will look to Todd Phillips to uh, kick us off. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, you are you have uh, agenda item F7, which is in season adjustments. So the under this particular agenda item, the manage measures for ground fish that the council sets are uh, done under a general understanding. The measures will be needed to be adjusted within the biennium to attain but not exceed annual catch limits. So this agenda item considers progress to date of the ground fish fishery and um, as well as any routine adjustments that need to be made to, for 2022 fisheries. Looking at this uh, particular agenda item, you have two reports in front of you. One is from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and you also have a GMT report. Your action is to obviously consider projections for the 2022 fisheries and adopt final in-season adjustments as necessary to achieve but not exceed annual catch limits and other management objectives. Uh, I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Otherwise, I would recommend moving right into the California Department of Fish and Wildlife report. Thank you. Very good. Uh, questions for Todd on his overview? All right. With that, we'll go to uh, Melanie Parker and the CDFW report. Melanie? Good morning, Vice Chair and Council Members. My name is Melanie Parker um, with the CDFW. I will be providing a summary of the Supplemental CDFW Report 1 on in-season adjustments. Um, this report is our standard um, in-season report that we provide at each Council meeting. Um, we do have some descriptions at the beginning of the report of what data is included and when the data is through, the date that the data are through. Um, we've also provided some additional information this year to describe our increased tracking efforts for specific species, um, including copper and coalback rockfishes, um, as a result of the new stock status information that became available last year. I'm not going to provide a um, exhaustive uh, review of all of the values that are in um, our tables. Um, I will, though, bring your attention to tables three and four on pages six and seven. Uh, these are tables that show our anticipated catch values, or ACVs, for quillback and copper rockfishes. Um, as we discussed and described extensively under agenda item F6, CDFW's in-season tracking process, um, there is a five to eight week lag time between when sample data are collected and when formal monthly catch estimates become available for our recreational fishery. Uh, because of that lag time, CDFW has developed this ACB process, which uses the relationship between number of sampled fish and the monthly estimates from past years. And we are able to generate this anticipated catch value that serves as a proxy um, during the time that you're waiting for estimates to become available. Once those estimates do become available, the ACV value is removed from our calculation of total mortality for the year. So table three is our coolback rockfish um, best estimate of catch both north and south of 4010. This best estimate of catch includes our ACVs from April through May. And at the time that we um, drafted this report, we only had ACV data through May 29th. Um, we only have formal monthly catch estimates through March at this point in time. April should be available shortly, at which time we will replace those April ACV values with the formal monthly serves catch estimate. Through May 29th, our ACV for Colback Rockfish north of 4010 was 0 0.3 metric tons, and south of 4010, it is 0 0.1 metric tons. And in Table 4, we have the same setup for Copper Rockfish. Um, copper Rockfish is more southerly distributed in California. Um, the fisheries do open earlier in the year in Southern California and Central California, so we do have some catch estimate data from March. And then we have our ACV data from April through May 29th. North of 4010, the copper rockfish best estimate of um, catch is 0 0.9 metric tons. And south of 4010, it is 11.3 metric tons. Uh, we will continue to update these tables and provide updates 
um, to the council at the September and November council meetings. We also anticipate continuing this in-season tracking process in 2023 and beyond. I next want to bring the council's attention to figures one, two, and three on the last three pages of the document. Um, we are now moving to commercial landings data. Figure one shows copper rockfish cumulative commercial landings um, from 2021 and 2022 so that we can directly compare the landings in 2022 where we have new sub trip limits in effect compared to those in 2021 when there were no sub trip limits. Um, the figure on figure one that is the top of the page is between 42 and 4010, and the orange line is the 2022 cumulative landings of copper rockfish. Uh, you can see it is significantly lower than the blue line, which was the cumulative landings in 2021. The bottom figure on figure one is for the area south of 4010 for copper rockfish. Again, the orange line is cumulative landings in 2022, which are significantly lower than what we saw in 2021 through this point in time. Figure two on page 11 is the same um, information for quillback rockfish. So north of 4010, between 42 and 4010, the orange line is our cumulative landings of quillback rockfish um, up to date. Um, and then the um, blue line is from 2021. You can see that landings of quillback rockfish in 2022 are significantly lower than what we saw last year. And the same trend is also consistent um, south of 4010, where the orange line is a lot lower than it was in uh, 2021. Something new we added to this report is figure three. This shows landings of other deeper nearshore rockfish. Um, so quillback and copper rockfishes are deeper nearshore rockfish. State of California has a deeper nearshore fishery permit that is tied to uh, the deeper nearshore species. So we are showing here in figure three what the landings are north and south of 4010 for those other deeper nearshore species. This does include black rockfish, blue rockfish, brown rockfish, calico rockfish, olive rockfish, and tree fish. Well, you can see that landings of these other deeper nearshore rockfish, which is the orange line in both the top and bottom figure, are higher than the blue line, which was our 2021 cumulative landings. Um, the scale of the landings is, um, they're, they're fairly similar. They're, um, we, we aren't seeing yet a significant um, deviation from prior year um, catch trends. And again, we'll provide uh, updates in September and November of this year of continued uh, commercial landings. So with that, I will take any questions. Okay, thank you, Melanie. Questions for Melanie on the CDFW report? Okay, not seeing any. Thank you, Melanie. Next up is the GMT report and uh, Whitney Roberts. Good morning, Council. Uh, for the record, my name is Whitney Roberts and I will be reading um, under F7, the ground fish management team report on in-season adjustments, final action. The ground fish management team discussed the current status of 2022 ground fish fisheries, requests from industry and any needs for in-season adjustments during the June 2022 Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting. The GM team may provide an additional supplemental report to discuss and provide recommendations on any remaining proposed adjustments. And of course we did not do that. There are no action items at this meeting. The GMT ran model projections to consider increases to the limited entry fixed gear sable fish trip limits north of 36 north latitude and open access sable fish trip limits north of 36 north latitude. However, given that sable fish bycatch in the trawl fishery is tracking high and that fixed gear attainment may improve compared to previous years, the GMT did not believe that increasing the sable fish trip limits at this time was appropriate. Additionally, the status quo trip limits currently in place are higher than nearly all historical trip limits. The, G the team will continue to monitor sable fish catches from all fisheries and participation in the fixed gear sectors to determine whether there is an opportunity to increase the trip limits in September 2022. 
for informational items at Sea Pacific Whiting. On May 22nd and 23rd, the mothership sector of the at Sea Pacific Whiting fishery experienced an unusually high bycatch event of sablefish north of 36 north latitude. 10 separate hauls out of a total of 388 hauls this year, each caught greater than 5,000 pounds or 2.3 metric tons, with the largest haul catching just over 50,000 pounds or 22.7 metric tons, which is the largest individual sablefish haul on record for the at sea sectors. The median of those 10 unusually large hauls was 18,839 pounds or 8.5 metric tons, and the total amount of sablefish taken by all 10 hauls was 225,595 pounds or 102.3 metric tons. All 10 hauls occurred in Southern Oregon waters at roughly 42 degrees, six minutes north latitude and 124 degrees, 36 minutes north latitude. Sorry, longitude, which is just off, that should be west longitude, which is just offshore of the port of Brookings, Oregon. Bottom depths range from 182 fathoms to 235 fathoms, with a mean of 212 fathoms. The at sea sectors notified the GMT immediately after the event, informing us that the co ops held an emergency meeting and implemented move along measures to prevent additional bycatch impacts in the area. As of June 11th, the at sea sectors have caught a total of 162 metric tons of sablefish north of 36 north latitude exceeding the 100 metric ton combined sector at sea set aside. Set asides do not trigger council action and the GMT is not recommending any action be taken at this time. However, given this high bycatch event, the team will continue to closely monitor sablefish catches from all sources of removals throughout the year and signal to the council if the team thinks action is necessary. As shown in table one below, the individual fishing quota and fixed gear sectors appear to also be tracking high compared to previous years, despite low fixed gear attainment in the last two years related to COVID-19 impacts and potentially other factors. However, the 2022 Sablefish North annual catch limit is 1,314 metric tons and 960 metric tons higher than those of 2017 and 2019 respectively, when the ACLs were exceeded due to a combination of high fixed gear attainment and high bycatch events. The GMT is also aware of increasing bycatch of northern sablefish in the market squid seine fishery, and while this is not an observed fishery, we will monitor catches to the extent that we can. For the Chinook salmon scorecard, table two shows Chinook salmon catches from groundfish fisheries and exempted fishing permits as of June 11, 2022, in relation to the sector thresholds. The GMT will report the Chinook salmon numbers from the year-round coastwide midwater rockfish EFP in other words, the trawl gear EFP during the March, June, and September council meetings. The North National Marine Fisheries Service will provide a full report on the Chinook salmon numbers from the year-round coastwide mid midwater rockfish EFP at the April and November meetings. <clears throat> and as you can see in table two, um, all sectors are well within their Chinook salmon thresholds. For the short belly rockfish scorecard, table three estimates that 66.1 metric tons of short belly rockfish has been taken as of June 11, 2022. The GMT notes that short belly rockfish is once again available on the public groundfish scorecard report GMT 007 on the PACFIN reports dashboard. <clears throat> For the rebuilding species scorecard, table four shows yellow eye rockfish projections from the groundfish fisheries as of June 11, 2022 in relation to the harvest guidelines and annual catch targets. The International Pacific Halibut Commission's annual stock assessment longline survey has just begun, but catches of yellow eye rockfish thus far are within the projected impacts, as you can see in table four below, um, which puts the projections at about 82% of the ACL. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you, Melody. Uh, questions for Melody on the GMT report? Heather all. Thank you, Vice Chair. I, I don't really have any questions. Uh, Whitney, I just wanted to thank the GMT for your good work on the statement for um, looking very carefully at opportunities to potentially increase the limited entry fixed gear trip limits, um, keeping your eye on that and, and for the good work and information you put together on uh, the sablefish catch in the, the whiting fishery and, and other fisheries. So. Uh, this is really helpful, and thank you. Thank you, Heather. Anyone else? 
Okay, Melanie, thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is the gap report. No gap report? Okay, that's right. All right, well, that takes us to uh, public comment. I don't think I saw any earlier. No, no public comment. All right. Well, that takes us to council action, if any. Yes, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, the council action is before you there on the screen is to uh, consider projections for 22 fisheries and adopt in-season adjustments as necessary. Thank you, Todd. I'm not seeing any hands. So maybe, maybe we're good. Okay, Todd, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to you. <laughs> Great, yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, based on the, the reports that you heard there, and uh, there were no requests for in-season actions, I would say that the council has, uh, has achieved their goals and, and as well as the action for this particular agenda item. Uh, thank you. Okay. okay, thank you, Todd. With that, I'll turn to uh, Executive Director Merrick Burden for uh, give us an uh, outline of how we're gonna proceed today. Merrick. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, uh, council members. So um, we, we are quite a bit ahead of schedule today. Um, I spoke on the uh, harvest specifications item earlier. So we're going to rearrange our agenda um, and I would recommend that we take up C5 and C6 um, and we'll try to buy ourselves some time instead of going right into the MPC item. We, we do have a few uh, bodies and entities, including folks with BOEM that we're coordinating with. Um, and so we're going to try to hold MPC items until one o'clock this afternoon uh, to help facilitate that coordination. So um, unless there's any objection, I would uh, recommend that we do go to C5 and C6, maybe give a minute for Mr. Berner to come to the table and help us walk through those items. Happy to take any questions, Mr. Vice Chairman. Okay, thank you, Merrick. Questions for Merrick? Okay, we'll wait till Mike gets in place before we uh, start off on C5. Okay, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Sorry for the delay there. Good morning, Council. Uh, agenda item C5, legislative matters. Uh, the Legislative Committee met uh, earlier in the week uh, and reviewed a number of items. Uh, they will be mostly informational uh, for you today, as you will see as we move through them. Uh, in your briefing materials is attachment one, which is a letter from U.S. Congressman Huffman to the U.S. House of Representatives Appropriation Committees. And I'll cover that in a minute. Additionally, in your supplemental materials, there's a supplemental legislative committee report that I'll also be giving here in just a bit. And we have a supplemental habitat committee report that are in your briefing materials. Uh, and I believe we will have someone from the habitat committee available for that. If not, I, I'm happy to read that uh, for you. Uh, Corey Green, I believe is online and be giving that, but if, if, if he's not uh, aware of our schedule here, I'll, I'll certainly do that. So unless there's any questions uh, of that, I'll move right into the legislative committee report. Okay, thank you, Mike. Questions for Mike? Ms. Overview? All right, Mike? Okay, like I mentioned, the legislative committee uh, met on Wednesday. Uh, we reviewed uh, a bill in the House 6865, the Don Young Coast Guard Authorization Act of 2022, specific elements of that bill, not the entire thing. 
Uh, we uh, reviewed recent legislative deliberations that happened at the Council Coordination Committee meeting uh, in Annapolis in May. And we reviewed the letter that's in attachment one from Jared Huffman to the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, the Legislative Committee would like to note that the Council has not received any formal requests for comments at this time uh, and that there has been little progress on federal fisheries legislation in part due to the delay in work on reauthorizing the Magnuson Act in response to the passing of Representative Don Young. Um, so I don't anticipate a need for any Council action under this agenda item. This is largely informational. At the March Legislative Council uh, session, uh, the council requested that staff review provisions of H.R. 6865, the Don Young Coast Guard Authorization Act of 2022, specifically provisions in the bill relative to automatic information system or AIS requirements for fishing vessels. Uh, the bill was reduced by introduced by Representative DeFazio of Oregon, and it passed the House in late March, and it is at the U.S. Senate now, where it's been referred to uh, the Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation, where it remains. Uh, the bill obviously authorizes appropriations uh, for the Coast Guard through fiscal year 2023, uh, but the bill also has uh, provisions in it regarding, regarding expanded requirements for AIS for fishing vessels. Uh, currently, self-propelled self commercial vessels of at least 65 feet of overall length are required to use AIS while operating within the navigable waters of the United States, which are generally defined as territorial seas within 12 nautical miles. Uh, the bill 6865 expands that requirement for EIS to the entire U.S. EEZ for vessels more than 65 feet in overall length while they're engaged in fishing, fish processing, or fish tendering operations. Uh, the Legislative Committee uh, expressed privacy concerns regarding the public availability of AIS information and felt that if the rationale for these expanded requirements in the bill is for improved domestic or international fishery monitoring, that a vessel monitoring systems would be more reliable for that task uh, and a more secure tool. Uh, again, this was a largely informational. This was a request that came out of March, and, and the council was not asked to comment or provide any feedback on this bill. So that's largely for your information at this point. Uh, the council also discussed uh, the letter I mentioned that's in attachment one uh, in response to recent assessments and associated data issues for quillback and copper rockfish. Uh, Representative Huffman sent a letter to the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Appropriations requesting $5 million to go to the National Marine Fishery Service Northwest Fishery Science Center to conduct coastwide fishery independent assessment of rockfishes over rocky habitat uh, beginning in California. The funding request remains under consideration. Uh, I'm not aware of any updates or, as to the status of that request, but uh, the Legislative Committee expressed appre appreciation for Representative Huffman's letter and the fact that it has elevated uh, this important survey matter, uh, regardless of what happens with the funding request. Uh, lastly, uh, kind of following up on your earlier agenda item this week on uh, CCC uh, matters that came out of the May meeting that was recently in Annapolis, uh, Chair Gorelnik and Vice Chair Pettinger uh, briefed the Legislative Committee on matters that were discussed at that meeting. Uh, particularly, there's a revised uh, Council Coordination Committee consensus statement on forage fish that was originally developed and reviewed by the Council uh, in response to provisions in MSA reauthorization bills. Uh, the recent revisions uh, were not substantial and do not, did not warrant uh, council revisitation of that statement. And the legislative committee and staff will continue to track that matter uh, when MSA reauthorization uh, efforts resume in Congress. Uh, one final uh, recommendation or update to you folks from the legislative committee is that they, they reviewed uh, activity uh, back in DC, which I mentioned is, is, is rather uh, slow at the moment for fisheries issues. And so this legislative committee is not recommending that they meet at the September meeting, but we'll continue to track activity back in Washington and we'll uh, inform the council in September whether or not a, a November legislative committee uh, meeting is, is warranted. So. Uh, that concludes the Legislative Committee's report. I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions for Mike? Okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, with that, we'll go to the uh, Habitat Committee report. And I see Corey Green is down, but I'm not sure if uh, he or another... Oh, he is. My bad. Corey. Can you hear me? We can. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the council. I'll be reading agenda item C.5.B, Supplemental Habitat Committee Report 1, Habitat Committee Report on Legislative Matters. The Habitat Committee would like to call attention to a bill, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, that would support the capacity of state and tribal fish and wildlife agencies to carry out their conservation plans. The act would appropriate $1.4 billion annually to state and tribal fish and wildlife agencies to reverse species declines as provided for in each state's wildlife action plans. There is broad support for this bill, including from the American Fisheries Society. The House Bill, H.R. 2773, is expected to go from committee to the full House next week and would potentially pass the Senate as S2373 this summer. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Corey. Questions for Corey on the Habitat Committee report? Okay, not seeing any. Thank you, Corey. And I would see, um, that's, that's our reports. Uh, any public comment? I don't see any. Nope. All right. Uh, well, that brings us to council action, which is to re review the information and give recommendations. So. I'm not seeing any hands there either. So with that, I'll go back to you, Mark. Mr. Chairman, this is Virgil. Sorry for missing you, Virgil. Yes, please. Um, just a quick question relative to process for the council um, in reference to the Habitat Committee's report on the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Is it appropriate or inappropriate at some point for the council to take a position on legislation? That's simply my question at this point. Thank you. Um, Chair Grolnick. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Virgil. Uh, it is not appropriate for the council to volunteer its position on federal legislation. We can, however, respond to congressional requests concerning legislation and their potential impact on matters that the council deals with. But we're not in a position to sui sponte offer our position on legislation. If we get a request uh, for comment from a congressional or Senate office, and then it'll be taken up by the legislative committee and then brought to the council. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Grolick. Thank you, Virgil. Okay. Mike. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I believe that concludes this agenda. I will update the uh, future meeting documents to reflect uh, a no legislative committee uh, items. So, for, oh, there's oh, Phil. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh. Phil Anderson. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I just um, on the um, in the legislative committee's report, it, it uh, talks about uh, HR 6865 and concerns about uh, the the requirements that are contained in that piece of legislation relative to AIS for vessels 65 feet and greater. Um, and um, as you obviously noted in the legislative committee's report, there were, there was concern amongst committee members with respect to the public availability of AIS information, particularly when vessels are engaged in their fishing operations. And I was um, in part because um, Congressman, um, Don Young's um, interest and then uh, understanding that it was uh, introduced by Representative DeFazio. Um, I'm just wondering what, if we know or whether we should seek to, to learn whether or not the North Pacific Council has provided any uh, perspective or if we could find out what their uh, what they're if they have a position or a concern relative to this aspect of this legislation what that might be so i'm just posing that as a 
question uh, and uh, so that in the event that this is still in play when we get together next time, we would have an understanding of whether or not there were concerns being expressed by the North Pacific Council or other councils for that matter. Thank you, Phil. Uh, my, Mike? Uh, I'm not aware of any other councils uh, have taken this up, but I can certainly do some homework and find out before we meet again. Thank you. Oh, okay, Mike, so now you can finish us off. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I was just saying that I will update our future meeting documents to reflect no legislative committee meeting in September, but I think we're done with this agenda item now. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Okay. Well, that takes us to... Um, C6, I believe. That would be uh, council meeting record. So, so Mark, uh, Chair Verrill, like, sorry. All right. Well, we'll take this. So we have C6, and we have um, before us uh, the task of approving previous council meeting records, and I will look to see if there is a motion or any discussion or any corrections to those meeting records. Pete Hassemer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Need to pull up a document here. Um, before we get started, typically we don't discuss this, but in looking through it to make sure we dot every I and cross every T on page seven, the roll call, um, there are some errors there with respect to who was present online and who was present in person. Uh, I think would, it would be appropriate, although it seems minor to correct that. So it is as accurate as we can make that. And probably through the motion, we could just designate that staff make those errors and publish an amended final meeting minutes. Thank you. Uh, to be clear, are you referring to the March or April? I'm sorry, I am referring to the March meeting. Thank you. Um, let me turn to staff. Mr. Berner, are you, are you aware of the corrections that need to be made? I'm not aware of the specific one, but we can certainly go back to that record. It is a little tricky to keep track of who is online and who is in person, but we will certainly revisit that and, and make that make sure that's corrected before we finalize. Okay, Pete. Yes, and again, I you know I apologize for that. I know the staff works very hard on this, but um, March was the first time in a long time we were in person. Um, many of us. Some, some of us missed it, and also in April, so i just highlight that at this point. Thanks. Uh, Butch Smith. Well, I went to that page, and it clearly says present or online. It doesn't, doesn't distinguish, and I don't know if that's, if you saw that, Peter, I'm all wet here, but it, it doesn't distinct about who was, you know, just either or that lists the people that were present or line at the meeting, the way I read that, but maybe I'm, El Waco education is always suspect. So I, I missed something, Pete, I, but that's how I read it either. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Hassemer. Uh, Thanks, Mr. Smith Butch. Um, uh, I think you identified the easy correction there is there are asterisks that try and indicate who was present online as opposed to um, in person. And if we just eliminate all the asterisks, we know who participated in the meeting. Okay, well, um, if there is a motion, if the motion Express, expressly provide some discretion to council's staff to make changes. I think that's a way we can proceed. So, Mr. Anderson. 
Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think I have a motion. If Sanders reading to my mind, as she usually does. <clears throat> Thank you, Sandra. I move the council approve the council meeting records as presented in agenda item C6, attachment one, draft council meeting record, 265th session of the Pacific Fishery Management Council, March 8th through the 14th, 2022, noting it's electronic only. And item C6, attachment two, draft council okay. meeting record, 266th session, of the Pacific Fishery Management Council, April 7 through the 13th, 2022, again, electronic only, and include the, the ability for staff to make corrections to the March 2022 meeting, page seven roll call for online and in-person participants. Great, right, thank you, Phil, for the motion. Is the language on the screen accurate and complete? I would just add the word the between include and ability in the last line there. Sandra, thank you. All right, is there a second? Seconded by Pete Hassemer. Please speak to your motion. I uh, appreciate all the work that goes into maintaining uh, our council meeting records. Um, it's an important piece of our work and appreciate Mr. Hassemer pointing out um, that several corrections may be needed relative to the March 22 meeting record relative to who was at the meeting in person versus online. Thank you. Are there any questions for the maker of the motion or discussion on the motion? And not seeing any hands, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Phil. So I believe that concludes our action under agenda item C6. So we've knocked out C5 and C6. I'll turn to Executive Director Merrick Burden about any other matter we might be able to move up. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if it pleases the council, I would suggest we pick up uh, budget committee matters at this time. Uh, we do have a couple of hours before our lunch break, and I think that gives us sufficient time to cover that issue. Well, I think we'll take a break, and then um, I'm not see he seeing any hands or wailing or gnashing of teeth about not taking that up, so I gather we will, but why don't we take um, a 15 minute break and we'll be back at 940 to take up agenda item C4. Is that acceptable to everyone? All right, 940.
if you take your seats, we'll get started here shortly. Okay, for those of the, you online uh, um, who weren't here earlier, we're going to go to C4, Fiscal Matters. And with that, I'll turn to Executive Director uh, Merrick Bird to uh, start us off here, Merrick. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, this is Agenda Item C4, Fiscal Matters. In your briefing book, there are a few things to orient you toward. In addition to the usual situation summary, you have uh, the agenda, that guided the budget committee earlier this week. You have an executive director's report in the form of a PowerPoint presentation. You have the supplemental budget committee report. Uh, there are no public comments that have been submitted on this agenda item. Um, happy to take any questions. Uh, otherwise, I would suggest going right to the budget committee report, and I'm happy to give that, Mr. Vice Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Merrick. Questions for uh, Merrick on his overview? Okay. Okay, thank you, council members and Mr. Vice Chairman. I'll be reading agenda item C4A, Supplemental Budget Committee Report 1, dated June 2022. The Pacific Fishery Management Council's Budget Committee met on Wednesday, June 8, 2022, to receive an update on the 2020 to 2024 Cooperative Agreement funding through May, review the calendar year staff proposed operational budget and consider other budget issues outlined in the budget committee agenda. National Marine Fisheries Service, West Coast Region, Sustainable Fisheries Division budget update. Mr. Ryan Wolf discussed the status of fiscal year 2022 WCR funding, which included an adjustment that will allow for some backfilling of vacant staff positions. Additionally, the WCR was awarded 170,000 to conduct an analysis that evaluates the cost associated with the ground fish trawl rationalization program. These funds will come to the council. It was also noted that NIMS received additional funding in fiscal year 2022 for offshore wind related issues, but those funds will be mainly distributed to the East Coast. Mr. Wolf noted that the fiscal year 2023 president's budget has been introduced with a requested increase to both the council's and commission's line items, as well as new funds to support efforts related to climate change, equity and environmental justice and offshore wind. The latter includes resources specifically directed to support NOAA's efforts on the West Coast. Finally, Mr. Wolf noted that climate change related funding, funding requests for fiscal year 2023 are focused on work by the science centers. It is anticipated that the fiscal year 2024 president's budget will have proposed increases related to management and work at the West Coast region. Executive Director's Report. Mr. Merrick Burden provided an overview of the council's grant and budget planning process this was followed by a presentation regarding the budget amounts that were proposed in the 2020 to 2024 grant request and compared those amounts to the level of income that the council has received since that time and that staff anticipate receiving in the next two years. The 2022 staff proposed budget is in line with the grant proposal for the same period. A 2022 fiscal snapshot was presented indicating funds on hand at the beginning of the year Funds received through May and estimates of funding expected to be received through the end of the year. The total funds available for the year are approximately 8.3 million, including funds from the delayed spending account, funds received and funds expected. The staff proposed operating budget is expected to result in a delayed spending account balance of 2.5 million at the end of 2022. Mr. Burden also presented a 2021 budget summary. 2021 expenditures equaled 95% of the 2021 operational budget of 5 million. Mr. Burden presented the 2022 proposed operational budget for discussion and compared the proposed budget, budget to the provisional budget that was adopted in November. The 2022 proposed operational operating budget, 5,798,871, 
is roughly $500,000 lower than the provisional budget. And these redu reductions include a reduction in travel expenses of 177,000, a reduction of 70,000 in staff expenses, a reduction in contracts of 146,000, and a reduction in services of 82,000. The proposed operating budget, if fully expended, will result in an end of year delayed spending account balance of approximately 2.5 million, a drawdown of roughly 735,000. The 2022 proposed operational budget also includes pass-through funding that was not included in the provisional budget. The budget committee then considered the council's fiscal outlook through the end of the grant period. For context, Mr. Burden presented expenses and budgets from 2015 to 2022 and drew particular attention to budget categories that have changed substantially during that period, including contracts, staff-related expenses, and travel. The committee noted that planned expenses for calendar year 2022 are roughly 700,000 higher than our expected income. And it was noted that this type of budget situation is not sustainable over the long term. Mr. Bur Burden proposed one or two special budget committee meetings over the summer months in order to more clearly identify budget priorities and to create a sustainable budget situation beyond 2022. Additional matters. <clears throat> The committee discussed the need to plan expenditures for the remainder of the grant, and in particular, how far to spend down the council's delayed spending account. The committee considered an additional meeting over the summer to explore long-term budget issues. The committee recommended that we tentatively plan for an October meeting instead of a summer meeting. Budget committee discussion on activities. The committee requested that staff develop two proposed preliminary budgets in anticipation of the September meeting, one balanced budget, expenses equal to income for 2023, and one budget that is designed to result in a fully depleted delayed spending account at the end of the current grant cycle. The BC also discussed the level of financial risk that the council should be prepared to manage the delayed spending account. In the event funding to the council is delayed, but no recommendation was made regarding this matter as staff are still compiling information to help advance this discussion. The BC also discussed how the council efficiencies white paper that is scheduled for September would be relevant to future budget considerations and reiterated the need for discussions about council operations and budgets to be held concurrently. It was noted that 2024 is both an election year and the end of our grant cycle, and that might affect the timing of funding for 2025. It was also noted that we had only received approximately half of our calendar year 2022 funds to date with no certain date on the remaining amount of funds to be made available. Comments were made about the current volatility of costs relating to fuel, cost of hotels and other items. And the BC was curious if that information was included in the current budget. Mr. Burden reiterated that with some of the current volatility that some of the current volatility wasn't included in the calendar year 2022 budget but staff would be working on including some of those into the calendar year 2023 budget development process. The BC recommended the proposed calendar year 2022 budget of $5,798,871 for adoption by the council and thanks staff for working through the budget adjustments and corrections. The committee supported having a September meeting and expressed support for an October interim meeting to discuss a strategic approach to future budgets. In summary, the budget committee recommendations are, one, adopt calendar year 2022 operational budget of $5,798,871. Two, hold a regularly scheduled budget committee meeting in September. Three, hold a special budget committee meeting in October 2022. And four, request staff create two preliminary budgets for calendar year 2023. First, a zero balanced budget, and second, to anticipate having minimal funds remaining in the delayed spending account at the end of the grant. That concludes the report of the Budget Committee. Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Merrick. Um, with that, um, our action is to consider the report and uh, recommendations uh, of the Budget Committee and open the floor for discussion. If any. Okay, Pete Hasselmer. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'd be prepared to make a motion, but I do not want to cut off any discussion that might occur. So it's your call. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not seeing any hands, so that's probably the next step, I think. So, and in line with how we're, things are going this morning. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Then I'll make a motion. I move the council adopt. Pausing here to, uh, if somebody's typing that, to provide some time. I move the council adopt the report and recommendations of the budget committee, agenda item C4A, supplemental budget committee report, June 2022. Okay, Pete, is the language of the screen accurate? Yes. Very good, second. Seconded by Heather Hall. Thank you, Heather. Um, you want to speak to your motion, Pete? Uh, no, I thank everybody for uh, uh, participating in the process and having those discussions and we'll continue the work. Thanks. Okay. Um, discussion on the motion. Okay. I'm not seeing any hands there either. So um, with that, I'll call for the question. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Merrick. And with that, um, I guess I'll look to you are the staff officer in this, so are we good? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, that does um, conclude the matter here before you on C4. And um, what it also does is it, uh, we are out of things to move up on the agenda. Um, so I think I would advise that we continue to hold the MPC item until one o'clock, just giving the coordination that we are attempting to do with a couple of different agencies. Um, and where I believe that would leave us is a very long lunch, Mr. Vice Chairman, unless there are other ideas. But that's what I would suggest. Oh. I do see Noah has their hand up. Uh, Ryan Wolf. Yeah, thanks. Um, I don't have any objection to that. I understand why you're waiting um, for our guests uh, for marine planning, but should there be additional time in the afternoon? I guess my question is, is there any possibility of bringing uh, forward the um, appointments and agenda item, or are you saying that that has to, that we'll definitely take that up tomorrow? Um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, I could, I'd be happy to uh, converse with uh, Deputy Director Berner. Um, I'm not sure exactly where we are on that matter at the moment. Um, maybe he can come to the table and help us understand whether we're ready. Uh, thank you, uh, Council. I think uh, we are waiting. The enforcement consultants have a statement regarding the COP that we'll be discussing under that agenda item. They are working to finalize their statement. Uh, today. So I think uh, possibly this afternoon they would be ready. I'd have to double check with them, but I think their plan was to reconvene at one to finalize that statement. I think everything else is in place for that agenda item. Okay. Okay. Very good. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass the gear. You see? Well, please come to the table, Greg. Yeah, Mr. Vice Chair, this is Greg Bush with the Enforcement Consultants. I just wanted to um, state that we can expedite the final clearance of our statement. And if we had uh, perhaps a 30 minute break, then we'd be prepared to have that final. I wouldn't want to hold up the agenda further just for our statement. Okay, thank you, Greg. All right. So with, the, with that, I'm going to pass the gavel back to uh, Chair Grolick, and uh, he can take it from here. So. All right, thank you very much. Um, marine planning is scheduled for two hours. It will certainly go longer than that. But I think we can endeavor, uh, if we finish that before 5 o'clock, to, to bring forward C7. And that will give the uh, uh, enforce, enforcement consultants and then more important, the secretariat time to 
to get that statement uploaded and available uh, to the public for review. So um, we will take a break here. And, uh, Mr. Anderson. Yeah, before we take our break, and I know you're all going to be maybe going outside for lunch, perhaps just wanted to make you aware that today is National Pigeon Day. So be kind to the pigeons when you're out. Uh, thank you. I think for those who are not aware, they're now aware. Um, all right. So with that, um, we'll take a break. We'll be back at 1 o'clock to tackle um, marine planning. And so uh, everyone enjoy your lunch.
Okay, we're going to get started here, it being one o'clock, and we have agenda item C3, Marine Planning. So I'll turn to uh, Staff Officer Kerry Griffin to get us started. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is agenda item C3, Marine Planning Update. Um, I'll cover uh, the situation summary and give a little agenda overview, agenda item overview. We also have a, a Marine Planning Committee report um, and uh, Mike Conroy will walk through that with some, with some PowerPoint slides. So there's a little redundancy. I'll, I'll try to not be overly redundant here with those two, but do wanna sort of highlight the um, main um, components of this agenda item. So the Marine Planning Committee met on May 24th uh, to consider issues that are currently at hand, and uh, that includes um, the uh, Oregon call areas notice that went out uh, several weeks ago, and there's a draft letter to BOEM, to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management on Oregon call areas. There's a draft um, policy guidance document that uh, the council saw an earlier version or versions of in March and, and asked us to come back at this meeting with a, uh, with a merged um, and more polished document. So those are both in the briefing book materials, attachment one and attachment two of this agenda item. Um, and then we talked about NOAA aquaculture opportunity areas uh, as well. And the notice of intent to produce a programmatic environmental impact statement was issued recently by NOAA as well. And there's an associated comment period uh, with that. Um, and then the uh, MPC also talked about, um, um, you know, trying to find a, a process for engagement. Um, it's been sometimes sort of fits and starts. Um, uh, as far as the uh, fishing sectors engaging in the bone planning process. And so, you know, we had some discussion about um, what that might look like. And, uh, and I know the council may want to continue that discussion under this agenda item. Um, but, you know, we want to process that is uh, sort of honors the, the um, mission of the council and the needs of the uh, fishing stakeholders and communities, um, you know, as well as uh, try to, work as well as we can in the process that uh, that BOEM is following. So um, that's one of the other things that we talked about. Um, and then in the sit sum, there's a little more background on the Oregon call areas draft letter and the guidance in the AOAs. I don't think I need to go into those. Um, uh, I'd be happy to answer some questions. But again, I think you'll hear a little bit more on that from Mr. Conroy in a minute. So I don't want to be redundant or get ahead of myself too much. Um, so there's a couple other things uh, that um, development developments that are out there. One is there's an unsolicited lease request off the coast of Washington that many of you are probably familiar with. There is no call areas, bone planning process right now off of Washington. And, and so there's no umbrella for a wind energy company to, um, you know, follow that, um, that uh, process, uh, but there is this unsolicited request that's out there that, uh, um, and I don't think there's been any response yet from BOEM, so we're kind of in a wait and see game on that. Um, oh, I do want to um, note that um, I haven't looked at the Ring Center webinar, but I do believe that we have rep representatives from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Um, and from um, the NOAA Aquaculture um, Program, Diane Windham. They're not planning a presentation or anything, but they're listening, they're here to answer questions, and, and they're ready to uh, respond to council questions or discussion, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and um, as far as materials, we have, as I mentioned, the draft letter on call areas, the draft policy guidance, there's the Supplemental Marine Planning Committee Report 1. There are supplemental reports from the Habitat Committee, the GAP, the HMSAS, and the CPSAS. Um, there's a supplemental, there's a couple of, well, there's a supplemental attachment which um, announces meetings that are happening this week on the 15th and 16th and 17th on the Oregon coast. And those are also, um, those will have an online link so you can attend virtually if you can't attend 
in person and the links are in that attachment. Um, uh, oh, I, I want to note, I think Mike might mention this too, but in, in the um, in the Marine Planning Committee report, you'll see four meetings noticed with links from BOEM that are on the fishery mitigation guidance that they've been working on. Those meetings have been postponed. I don't think they've been rescheduled yet. Um, I'm not sure the reason or the timing, but I do want to note that the ones that are in the MPC report have been postponed. Um, and then one more thing that I just noticed today, uh, haven't had a chance to put it in our PowerPoint or anything, Mike, is that NOAA announced a aquaculture strategic plan for comments. Um, and so that's something else that uh, we might have to, um, you know, address it at some sort. But again, I saw that like an hour ago, so um, that's fresh. Um, back to the materials, uh, there also are some public comments that are in the e-portal. Uh, I don't know how many people have signed up for comment though yet. So as far as the, uh, the order of events here after my overview, we'll go to the reports and comments of management entities and advisory bodies. Um, I think we have a ODF and W and a, um, and a tribal report. And then we'll turn to Mike Conroy, who's a co-chair of the Marine Planning Committee. And he'll walk through the report. He's not gonna read it verbally, uh, uh, but he has a PowerPoint presentation that gets at all the main points. Um, and then we'll move on to the rest of the um, uh, advisory body reports. And I think there are four primary ones. Uh, they all know, or they all should know that uh, if it's more than about one page, they should do their best to summarize the report and not read everything verbatim. Um, but again, we don't have the volume of reports that we have in the past. So hopefully that won't take too long. And then the council action, or then public comment, and then the council action is to approve the final recommendations on the Oregon call areas, review and adopt the draft policy guidance document, and develop comments on the aquaculture opportunity areas programmatic environmental impact statement. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a couple other things that have come up since I wrote this um, situation summary. Um, and when we get to council guidance, uh, we'll flash those up on the screen. You know, one is this, the, the fishery mitigation uh, item. Um, and then there's the proposed sale notice for California wind energy areas. Um, and so we wanna make sure that the council has a chance to discuss and uh, take action on those. And we'll put those up on the screen when we get into council action. So I think uh, that is my overview of the agenda item. I'd be happy to take any you know process questions on this. Um, and if not, then we can move on with the um, agency reports. All right, thank you very much, Carrie. Uh, are there any questions of Carrie on the overview? All right, thanks very much, Carrie. So we'll first go to our manage management entity reports and uh, Dr. Karen Braby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm gonna be brief um, for the uh, briefing book record. Uh, I posted a, a letter that ODFW wrote on the state process uh, for offshore wind planning uh, that is being led by our sister agency, the Oregon Department of Energy. And that process is, is in response to an Oregon legislative bill that asked for them to conduct a feasibility study and submit a report to the legislature that's due this upcoming September. And while it's not directly uh, applicable to the federal PFMC process, I think there are some similarities there and we have posted materials from our state process to the council's briefing book in past meetings just for that kind of cross fertilization and, and to make sure that those resources are available to everyone. So really briefly, I'll just highlight what's in the letter, um, but like I said, it's posted. You can read it at your leisure if you would like to see some of the details. Um, but the, the first section lays out the ODFW view on responsible renewable energy development, um, where we reaffirm that we support transition uh, to clean uh, energy sources uh, and 
uh, just flag that that needs to be done in a way that's responsible, that's something that we all have in common, and uh, uh, make sure that, that we're not trading one problem for another. Uh, the second section goes into some, um, some comments about ocean fisheries, coastal habitats, and ecosystem assessment uh, resources that are, are either uh, missing or are in the process of being analyzed uh, and that we prioritize that those uh, assessments and data gaps be filled um, before we move forward. And we've asked our sister agency to highlight this in their report to the legislature. Um, the third section is on timeline and process disconnect. And this does maybe more directly relate to the council process where we have um, a parallel process in Oregon with the state legislature running a process, we have uh, the governor and Boehm uh, State of Oregon agreement to uh, move forward with the task force process. And, um, and those two don't have any regulatory expectation of cross fertilizing and working together. And so it's just recognition that alignment is helpful and uh, to do that as we can. And, and I think that's relevant to the, to the PFMC process as well. Um, and then the fourth section speaks to Oregon's policy uh, principles related to the precautionary approach uh, and uh, asks for uh, more comprehensive planning on offshore wind um, moving forward after the, the Oregon Department of Energy report is finalized. So I provide that as just another piece of the puzzle that we're all working on in, in thinking about offshore wind development. Uh, in particular, I also wanted to highlight that in the public comment section, there is a letter that's submitted under uh, the name David Brock Smith. That's one of our Oregon legislators. Um, and he has filed a public comment letter, um, which is a copy of a letter that he submitted to um, Bohm uh, on their process that um, also would be of interest um, for those of you who want to understand the mechanics of the Oregon process. With that, I'll conclude my report, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions on the ODFNW report? Mm -hmm. Not seeing any hands, thank you very much. We have a travel report, Mr. Oatman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've been asked to uh, provide some points on behalf of the Macaw tribe and the Quinault Indian Nation. Uh, before I do so, I do want to acknowledge that uh, they are still courting with the other coastal tribes, so the Quoyut and the Ho. They haven't had opportunity to uh, do that uh, as of yet. So the Macaw tribe and the Quinault Indian Nation have been engaged in the marine planning offshore wind process, including discussions with BOEM. They believe that the process of identifying and leasing wind energy areas is moving much too quickly. From the travel perspective, many potential negative impacts on the California current ecosystem and the aquatic resources on which they depend have not been adequately identified or addressed by BOEM. They are very concerned with the cumulative impact of wind energy areas in California, Oregon, and Washington, and that area-specific environmental assessments will be inadequate to protect the tribe's treaty fishing rights. They are particularly concerned with potential cumulative impacts to oceanographic processes and resources, including upwelling, impacts on migratory stocks of treaty fish, and impacts on marine mammals and displacement of its existing fisheries that could impact tribal fisheries. Therefore, they believe that a full programmatic environmental impact statement should be completed prior to leasing any wind energy sites and that this EIS should analyze total cumulative impacts within the California current ecosystem and address the concerns that they have. With that, Mr. Chair and Council, um, I want to provide those comments on behalf of the McCaw and Quinault. All right, thank you uh, very much. Are there any questions on the travel report? 
Great, thank you very much. With much anticipation, we now go to the report of the Marine Planning Committee, Mike Conroy. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, my name is Mike Conroy. I, along with Susan Chambers, I am co-chair of the Council's Ad Hoc Marine Planning Committee. Uh, before diving in, I, I do want to provide an overview of the presentation that you're about to receive. Um, there are a number of items which are included in the briefing book. Um, as Kerry noted, the following were submitted before the advanced briefing book deadline. You had an early draft of a council comment letter for the two call areas off of Oregon and an updated draft policy guidance document. Um, in the interest of time, our presentation interweaves information contained in those documents and our supplemental report. Uh, we will be providing updates on recent events regarding offshore wind off all three states, uh, an update on Prog progress with regards to identifying aquaculture opportunity areas within the Southern California Bight, uh, a brief discussion on the policy guidance document, and then some items that are specifically focused on the Marine Planning Committee. Uh, we have a brief overview of the history, purpose, and membership of the committee, kind of a backward look and review of MPC activities and work products over the past year, uh, a forward looking preview of known opportunities for additional Marine Planning Committee work products and some topics which may be ripe for further council discussion and or guidance. Um, we seek initial MPC feedback on future MPC meetings and workload planning. Next slide, please. Thank you. So during its April meeting, the California Coastal Commission conditionally concurred in Bohm's request for a consistency determination with regard to leasing in the Humboldt wind energy area. Uh, the Supplemental Habitat Committee report outlines the seven conditions which were incorporated into that conditional concurrence. On May 31st, Bohm published a proposed sale notice for the Humboldt and Morro Bay wind energy areas. There is a public comment deadline which closes on August 1st. We will address this on a, separately in a future slide. On May 5th, Bohm issued a news release announcing the availability of the Humboldt wind energy area final environmental assessment and a finding of no significant impact. As a reminder, Bohm does not consider the issuance of a lease to constitute an irreversible and irrevocable or irretrievable commitment of agency resources, as the lease does not by itself authorize any activity within the lease area. Upon submission of a site assessment plan, a lessee may conduct site characterization and site assessment activities only. Bohm maintains that the issuance of a lease conveys no right to the lessee to, to proceed with development of a wind energy facility. The lessee only acquires the exclusive right to submit a plan to conduct this activity. While we have not yet had a chance to do a deep dive to determine whether comments you submitted on the draft EA were incorporated into the final EA, a cursory review would appear to suggest that not all were addressed or incorporated in the final EA. The comment period for the Morrow Bay draft EA closed on May 16th. We expect the EA will be finalized soon with a finding of no significant impact. While Bohm can issue a proposed sale notice without a final environmental assessment, we believe the EA must be finalized before lease sales can occur. Last Wednesday, the California Coastal Commission conditionally concurred in Bohm's request for a consistency determination with regard to leasing in the Morro Bay Wind Energy Area. Uh, Coastal Commission staff have offered to answer any questions you may have resulting from your discussions or deliberations or in any future meeting of the Marine Planning Committee. On June 27th, the California Energy Commission uh, will conduct a workshop related to the CEC's draft report offshore wind energy development off the California coast, maximum feasible capacity and megawatt planning goals for 2030 and 2045. This will be a follow-up to the Energy Commission's May 18th workshop, presenting the draft report and receiving public comments. In the draft report, CEC established a preliminary planning goal of three gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, increasing to 10 to 15 gigawatts by 2045. Based on information received during that workshop, this upcoming workshop will consider possible upward changes to the draft recommendations for megawatt offshore wind planning goals for 2030 and 2045. This could expedite the identification of additional call areas off California or moving forward with the Diablo Canyon call area in order to meet these goals. Next slide, please. Um, 
As noted earlier, on May 31st, Bohm published a, in the Federal Register the proposed sale notice for Humboldt and Morro Bay wind energy areas. The PSN, the proposed sale notice describes the five areas available for leasing, two within the Humboldt wind energy area and three within Morro Bay. Some bidding credits that would be available to qualified bidders. The 20% bidding credit would apply to those builders willing to commit to invest in programs that will advance U.S. offshore wind energy workforce training and or supply chain development. There is a 2.5% bidding credit for an existing community benefit agreement or a commitment to enter into a new community benefit agreement with a commit community or stakeholder group whose use of the geographic space of the lease area or whose use of the resources harvested from that geographic space is directly impacted by the lessee's potential offshore wind development. Also included is proposed conditions and stipulations of a lease, proposed auction format and procedures, and specific questions upon which BOEM is seeking feedback. There is a list of 10 or 11 of them. They're included in the Marine Planning Committee's supplemental report, I believe. If not, um, and then the process for issuing a lease. Next slide, please. Moving to Oregon. On April 28th, Bohm published a call for information on two call areas off the Oregon coast. The public comment period closes on June 28th. The call seeks specific and detailed comments on 11 specific items, including geological, geophysical, and biological conditions, including bottom and shallow hazards and live bottom other uses of the Outer Continental Shelf in or near the call areas, particularly with regard to vessel navigation, additional information regarding recreational, commercial, recreational and commercial fisheries, including but not limited to the use of the areas, the gear types used, seasonal use, and recommendations for reducing use conflicts, other relevant socioeconomic, cultural, biological, and environmental information. And finally, any other relevant information BOEM should consider during its planning and decision-making process for the purpose of identifying areas to lease within the call areas. During your March meeting, we presented a graphic which identified three proposed call areas. The proposed abandoned call area was not included in the April 28th Federal Register Notice. Um, we want to remind you of the OroWind map data portal and mapping tool. It was created in support of the BOEM Oregon Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force to inform the data gathering and engagement plan for offshore wind energy in Oregon. It provides public access to the best available data available being used throughout the offshore wind planning process in Oregon. BOEM has expressed an intention to conduct lease sales off Oregon in late 2023. Uh, to meet that timeline, it is not outside the realm of possibility that wind energy areas will be ID'd off Oregon by the end of this year. Um, as a reminder, a wind energy area can be the entire call area or a smaller portion of a call area. Uh, a wind energy area cannot contain waters which are not identified in a call area. As you will recall, when in Morro Bay, they extended the call areas, issued a new call when they extended that call area out to 399 square miles. As noted earlier, a draft comment letter was included in the advanced briefing book. As you review and offer thoughts on that letter, be kind, we rushed to get something submitted by the advanced briefing book deadline. Uh, then we have a couple of slides just pointing out the two specific call areas. This is the Coos Bay call area. It begins roughly 14 miles offshore Charleston, Oregon, and extends to about 65 miles offshore. The eastern boundary water depth ranges from 65 fathoms, 120 meters, to 120 fathoms, 220 meters, the area is about 67 miles in length, north-south, and about 41 miles in width from east to west. The entire area is approximately 875,000 acres or 1,364 square miles. The estimated offshore wind power capacity of this call area is roughly 10.6 gigawatts. Next slide. Next, we have the Brookings call area. It also begins about 14 miles offshore. Here it's Gold Beach and Brookings and extends to about 46 miles offshore. The eastern boundary water depth ranges from about 68 fathoms or 125 meters to 186 fathoms or 340 meters. The area is about 46 miles in length from north to south and about 22 miles in width from east to west. The entire area is approximately 285,000 acres or about 448 square miles. The estimated offshore wind power capacity is about 3.5 gigawatts. 
Next, we're going to discuss the unsolicited lease request off of Washington. On April 12th of 2022, Olympic Wind submitted an unsolicited lease request for an Outer Continental Shelf Renewable Energy commercial lease to Bohm. In our supplemental report, Bohm did not have a detailed update for the MPC on, Olympic, on the Olympic Wind unsolicited lease proposal, except to say that they were reviewing the applicant's legal, technical, and financial qualifications. The regulatory framework described under 30 CFR 585.230, 231, and 232 outlines a non-competitive lease process, including those instances where Bohm determines that there is competitive interest in the lease area. While we are unaware of any new activity on the unsolicited lease request, we understand that the Washington Coastal Marine Advisory Committee will be meeting on June 15th, and we believe Olympic Wind will be part of that agenda. Moving on to aquaculture. As a reminder, in November, NOAA published a tech memo entitled an Aquaculture Opportunity Area Atlas for the Southern California Bite. This, will, this was the result of NOAA's National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science collaborating with NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service to initiate a marine spatial planning study to identify potential AOA options in the federal waters of the Southern California Bight. An authoritative spatial data inventory was developed that included data layers relevant to administrative boundaries, national security, navigation, transportation, energy and industry, infrastructure, commercial and recreational fishery, and on. This resulted in the identification of 10 discrete AOAs as depicted on the graphic on this slide. On May 27th, NOAA published in the Federal Register a notice of intent to prepare a programmatic EIS for identification of one or more AOAs in Southern California. The federal action proposed in the programmatic EIS is to identify one or more locations referred to as AOAs that may be suitable for multiple future offshore aquaculture projects in federal waters off the Southern, of the Southern California Bight and to evaluate the impacts of siting aquaculture in these locations. There is a public comment period which ends on July 22nd. The NOI seeks public input on 16 specific items, four of which may be of particular interest to the council family. The types of aquaculture, whether it be fin fish, shellfish, seaweed, integrated multi-trophic aquaculture that could be supported or analyzed. Potential impacts to biological, physical, social, cultural, and economic resources. Potential interactions with protected species, EFH, and other sensitive habitats. And potential interactions with commercial and recreational fishing industries, tourism and recreation, and other offshore ocean uses. Uh, we note that NOAA has scheduled two virtual public scoping meetings, one from noon to 2 p.m. on June 27th, and one on July 11th from 5 to 7 p.m. Additional information, including instructions for how to participate in these virtual meetings, can be found on, NOAA's, on the NOAA webpage dedicated to the Southern California Aquaculture Opportunity Area. Um, as Kerry noted, uh, NOAA apparently today released an aquaculture, aquaculture strategic plan, which I assume will include an opportunity for public comment. As a reminder, this policy guidance document that's in the briefing book results from your guidance in March to combine the two draft policy documents that were created by the Marine Planning Committee and the Habitat Committee uh, that you were shown in March on ocean development activities, combine those into a single document for consideration at this meeting. The Ecosystem Work Group also presented a standalone policy document that you directed remain a standalone document with further work on it suspended until the council provided guidance at this meeting. Um, you'll see we provide a statement of the document's intent. You will also notice that we provide a few items which we believe are ripe for your discussion and or guidance. Uh, for example, is this an outward facing document or one that is designed for internal purposes? Um, as you've heard today, NOAA is in the process of conducting an environmental review on AOAs in the Southern California Bight. Should aquaculture and other potential offshore development activities be included in this guidance document or should those be addressed separately? Um, is this going to be a living document that we revisit and review as we learn more as circumstances or conditions change? And then we, there are several suggestions for improvement are included in the Marine Planning Committee report. Um, this slide is just a review of how the MPC came into existence, uh, the purpose for which it was established, and the current makeup of the Marine Planning Committee. Uh, we're one year into our existence, so we believe it might be a good time to think about what's working well, what's not working, 
the workload, uh, et cetera. So this slide is, is, is simply a review of what the MPC has done over the course of the last uh, 12 months. As you will hear in a, few, in a few slides, the workload has been at times uh, overwhelming. Uh, this slide is a more of a forward-looking schedule of known comment opportunities and deadlines, which we already know. Um, for example, we have the Oregon uh, call areas letter due on the 28th. Um, Boehm recently postponed, as Kerry noted, Boehm recently postponed meetings on draft guidance on mitigating impacts from offshore wind projects on fisheries. The purpose of these meetings was to discuss draft guidance for a way to minimize, to, sorry, to mitigate impacts from offshore wind projects and commercial and recreational fisheries and fishing. Um, this follows a public comment opportunity that arose at the end of last year. Um, the guide, given what the, Given the language that was included in the notice that was sent out uh, providing acknowledgement of these meetings, we expect that there will be draft guidance on this and there will be public comment opportunities available on that as well. Um, just with regard to the associated meetings, hearings, and admin, uh, supplemental attachment three informs the public that this week there are three meetings scheduled with off Oregon offshore wind energy input opportunity, which are open to all fishing sectors for formal public comments on the call areas. And then just as to note, in, in any given week, there are countless meetings, webinars, administrative agency proceedings, et cetera, taking place in which offshore wind and or other important offshore development activities are discussed. For instance, just last Friday, what's highlighted in red here, Boehm announced it'll hold an auction seminar for prospective bidders, which will be open to the public for this is for the uh, proposed sale notice off the state of California. Seminar will describe the auction format, explain the auction rules, and demonstrate the auction process through a meaningful example. This takes place Thursday from nine to noon. Next slide, please. We find ourselves, the MPC finds itself acting more in a reactionary posture. I think we would all benefit from contemplating how we can become more pro proactive in our approach. Um, you know, we, we've been through the California process from call area designation to proposed sale notice, and we're getting ready to see this come through with regards to Oregon. And I think we can, as we plan for what's coming with regards to Oregon, we can certainly learn from the experiences that we had with California. Uh, granted, there will be different in terms of different habitat, fisheries, and whatnot. It's still, I think, the underlying rationale and the underlying thought processes behind our comments will, will be the same. Um, we think the following topics are ripe for conversation. Um, should we schedule a Marine Planning Committee meeting well in advance of each council meeting? Should we do more frequent meetings? Um, is the QR process working for Marine Planning Committee items? How can we make it easier for you all? In addition to fisheries and habitat issues, where do ecosystem, where do ecosystem issues fall into the mix? Um, we, we have heard a number of requests to record our meetings and webinars. Is that something that you all think would be advisable or doable? And then are there any thoughts or ideas for how to better work with the various fishing sectors and BOEM? There continues to be a disconnect in terms of engagement between BOEM and the fishing industry. While BOEM had discussed the possibility of sector-specific meetings with the fishing industry in May, those never moved forward. Uh, we do note, as, as I mentioned earlier, Supplemental Attachment 3 does reference three upcoming meeting in fishing industry meetings being facilitated by Midwater Trawlers Cooperative, the Oregon Trawl Commission, and BOEM. Next slide. Slide 12 outlined much of what was ID'd in our supplemental port report. Uh, as you are all well aware, topics being discussed by the Marine Planning Committee are of great interest as is evidenced by attendance at Marine Planning Committee meetings and participation, participation by the advisory bodies in Marine Planning Committee agenda items. Um, while this may come across as a complaint, it isn't. I think Carrie, Susan, and myself can attest to the substantial workload that the MPC is undertaking. That we have planned and held seven Marine Planning Committees as well as pushed out 15 important comment letters over the course of the last year speaks to that. Um, the, as I mentioned earlier, timing of meetings. This is tricky, particularly if we have any in-person meetings in conjunction with the council meeting. That'll be difficult given that most of us participate in other council ABs and finding time to meet in person would be, would be difficult. 
As previously noted, we've considered a number of different options for conducting future meetings of the Marine Planning Committee. Uh, do we have a longer standalone meeting of one to three days while in advance of council meetings? Uh, do we have shorter, more frequent meetings? Uh, can we establish monthly virtual meetings? Or is there some combination of those that would seem to work well for you? Uh, we understand and acknowledge that each of these carry unique challenges. Um, standing Marine, we, we also think that a standing Marine planning item on every council meeting agenda starting in September of 2022 would be helpful. Um, on a personal note, I know that Carrie, Susan, and myself ha have discussed possible approaches that could be implemented to reduce the possibility of repetitive comments in advisory body statements. And that's it. Thank you. Sorry I took so long. <laughs> and I'll no, be happy at all. to answer any questions. We very informative. There's obviously a lot going on, and I imagine there may be some questions. Dr. Braby? Yeah, I, I really appreciate the presentation, focusing in on everything that's happened and some of the questions that you will want to discuss. And I want to express my personal appreciation to the MPC committee for the very heavy lift you have carried over the last year. Uh, creating the airplane while it's being flown and producing 15 comment letters um, as well as a number of lengthy reports. Um, it is a body of work that I am proud to be associated with and, um, and I think it has really focused the council on not only our our support of a clean energy future and dealing with climate change and impacts to our fisheries, but also where the intersection is between, you know, those issues and, and what the council responsibilities are and, and couldn't, couldn't have done it without that committee. And I'm so grateful that, uh, for your work. And, and thank you. You know, you've, you've been involved in many of the meetings, conversations and whatnot, and if we're building the airplane while it's, if we're flying the airplane while it's being built, you might be piloting it. So thank you. <laughs> I, I will defer to <laughs> others on that. It's been, it's been a, a, a group effort. Um, I, I want to ask you, because you were in the chair there, um, about the um, process moving forward. We've built the council has agreed that this committee should be in place for two years. I think it's likely it will be extended. Um, and lessons learned from the past, you're, you're talking about different meeting formats and so on. Where, can you maybe help us understand a little bit more where the real problems arise and how we can, how we can try and help um, smooth some of those bumps in the road? Yeah, turbulence, through, if you will, <laughs> through the chair. And, and, and thank you for that question. Um, you know, just looking back at this most recent iteration of Marine Planning Committee meetings leading up to this council meeting, um, you know, we had our meeting, I believe it was on May 24th. Um, that did not leave an overabundance of time to take what we learned during that meeting, present it in some usable, useful format and get it submitted to the briefing book. Um, so I think you know, we're looking at the possibility of having, rather than having it being so close to a council meeting, you know, have it be more, more in advance of it to allow us to you know, prepare materials, get them done, get them submitted, you know, make sure that they're, they're presenting the information that not only we think is important, but we think that others will think is important. And I think having benefit of additional time to do that would be helpful. Um, I think we, we had discussed in, in a recent call, you know, having scheduling meetings six weeks before each council meeting, which, which would seem to allow us to do that, um, save those items that would arise between that meeting date and then the start of a council meeting, which, you know, it's not outside the realm of possibility that there'll be at least one or two things that pop up between then, but that's what the supplemental re report would be possible for us. So I think in terms of preparing and getting ready for each council meeting, something a month or, or a month and a half before a council meeting, I think would be helpful. We also discuss monthly check-ins and then we, you know, the administrative part of that probably outweighs the benefits that would be derived from hosting that type of meeting process, but that's something to consider as well. Please. 
Thank you, um, Chair. And as a follow up, and this is not a fair question, so I'm warning you. Um, out of all of the activities and the letters that have been written in the last year, I'm asking your personal opinion, is there anything that was extra that we could have said in retrospect? That's something that maybe we didn't need to weigh in on. That is a great question. <laughs> um, I, think, I think everything that we have submitted was worthy of submitting. Um, if I had to pick out one, and, and, and I hate to pick on the Coast Guard, uh, but it would be that first PAC PARS comment letter, given how early it is in the process and how many additional comment opportunities there will be. But I think the ability for us to plant that flag during that public comment period, I, I think is, is I, I wouldn't suggest that we retract it. And Please. just teeing up, I think you understand and the other council members understand why I'm asking. I'm, I'm looking for, for opportunities to be more strategic in, in how we task workload to the committee and to ourselves. Um, and, and we want to be effective. And so I, it's hard for me to look at the body of work and, and call something out and put it aside as well. But I wanted an opportunity to ask you. Um, and then kind of plant the question for my fellow council members for a council discussion later. Yeah, thank you, and I appreciate that. And I think, you know, one of the comments that I made in, during the presentation was is that we're gonna have the ability to learn from the experiences that we undertook with California. You know, we submitted comments on, on draft EAs, and I think that when we get to that process in Oregon, there's going to be a framework there that is not going to require a reinventing of the wheel. So I think, you know, process-wise, it, 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 it will hopefully get easier for us, uh, given that we're not having to reinvent the wheel. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm less worried... I, I'm less worrying about uh, less worried about curveballs being thrown. I guess is, is where I'm trying to go with this. All right, John Ugaritz. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Karin and Mike, for that discussion. I found that very helpful. I have a sort of follow up, Mike, on what Karin was asking. Um, in particular, looking at things like council comments on draft EAs when reviewing final EAs where we have commented on the drafts, are there instances where it appears that our commentary has either been uh, ignored, not included, um, responded to in a manner which indicates it wasn't taken into account? Do you have examples like that? Uh, through the chair. Yeah, th thanks for that question, John. We have only one final EA for the Humboldt Wind Energy area. Uh, the, the council did submit a comment on the draft EA. Um, I haven't, and I don't believe any carry or anybody else from the Marine Planning Committee has done a side-by-side -side look at the final compared to the draft and then seeing if the comments that the council provided were incorporated. Um, having said that, I, I, I did do a rather cursory review, and some of the things that, that, that the council highlighted as important did not appear to be incorporated into the final EA, no. Thanks, Mike. Further questions of the Marine Planning Committee? Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the report. I... Um, I've been thinking about the uh, um, really the bandwidth issue. Um, we we talk a lot about wind, and we talk a lot about aquaculture. Um, in the Western Pacific, there's a lot of conversation around underseas mining, and I I'm just wondering in terms of the committee, which has done an incredible amount of work in the last year. Um, do we have the bandwidth as more? items come on board, or do we need to be looking at how to build capacity um, in the event we have issues, um, in addition to what we're already looking at, kind of exponentially grow, and, and how likely do you see that in the short-term and long-term horizons? 
through the chair. Yeah, thanks, Krista, for that. That that's a great question. Uh, you know, we've all heard, you know, potential undersea mining. Uh, we've heard potential server farms uh, located in the ocean. We, we we've heard other potential development activities uh, that could compete with with our mission as the council. Um, I, I worry about the bandwidth problem. Obviously, um, you know it's. I, I'm not saying that we're that we're biting off more than we can chew right now, but I think we're. And, and Carrie, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're we're we're, we're approaching <laughs> we're approaching that point, um, and I think adding additional things could be problematic. It's you know, especially in a in a realm that we're unfamiliar with. You know, I think those of us in the Marine Planning Committee are pretty familiar with the bone process and what's going on in three different states. So we're not having to relearn things. Whereas, you know, if there are server farms or if undersea mining or something else is contemplated, then that's going to, you know, the, the the learning curve on that is is probably going to be pretty steep and require some additional bandwidth. Further questions of the MPC? Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Mike. Um, just want to start off by echoing Karen's appreciation for the MPC and all the work that you all have been doing. Um, you gave a nice overview here, and it's pretty clear. It's, it's taken a lot of time and resources. So many thanks to you all and to council staff for, for doing all this work. Um, I have a couple questions about the MPC's recommendations on the draft proposed policy guidance for offshore development activities, which I think will be relevant for council discussion in, in terms of um, workload planning. Um, first question is about um, the number 17 in, in the report. It says just the, the recommendation is for the policy to describe cumulative effects. Um, I'm noting that in the policy, cumulative effects are actually mentioned a couple times already. So just wanted to see if there was a little more behind that in terms of what the committee is thinking about, what the committee would like to see. Um, we heard um, a little bit ago that this is important um, from the tribal report, and it's also something that's important to me. So um, just wanted to get some of your thoughts on that. Thanks. Through the chair. Uh, th thanks for the question, Corey. I, I'm going to sit here and claim ignorance because I don't have it sitting in front of me. I'm, I'm going to assume, since it's been something that we have discussed uh, a, a number of times, is you know the, the the conversations around the cumulative impacts, cumulative effects of uh, not only lease activities but also offshore wind farms um, have not is not something that has been looked at as of yet. Um, the council and and others have sort of prodded bone to to consider doing that sooner than later, um, but that's not something that uh, that comes to the table until the uh, constructions and operations plan is submitted. Um, I will defer to Kerry if, if if perhaps he knew what you were asking <laughs> or has a better answer. <laughs> Kerry, thank you, Mr. MPC Chair. Mr. <laughs> Chair, um, I don't have a whole lot to add. Um, the uh, the Habitat Committee did discuss this, and there's a couple of nuances to cumulative effects, and um, so I think that might be where that comment came from. We did uh, get some informal feedback from various uh, members from the MPC and the Habitat Committee, so I don't remember if, where exactly that comment came from, but there's a couple of ways to look at the cumulative effects. Um, you know, one is, the first of all acknowledging that you know planning for wind farms will lead to wind farm development uh, and then looking at the impacts of multiple wind farms along the coast and in the california current and then also sort of a um a temporal cumulative effects thing that that would that would um wrap in uh the earlier planning stages including the um, site assessment and characterization activities, which right now are treated separately as a standalone, um, you know, NEPA issue. Um, and that's, that's, that's where, like in California, that's where they are right now with these EAs on the Morro Bay and the Humboldt Bay wind energy area. So there's some sense that the cumulative effects should not only look at, you know, multiple activities that are going to be built out there someday, but also start at chronologically at, at the beginning. So 
Um, I'd have to double check with my colleagues, but uh, I think I think that was the point of putting that in there is that we might need we might want a little more um, description and nuance in the cumulative effects section. Thanks for that. Um, my my second question on those lines is the um, you briefly outlined sort of what this policy statement might be capable of doing and how it could be used. And I was wondering if you could provide a little bit more about that, any specifics about where you'd like to see it go or specifically how the MPC could utilize it moving forward. Yeah, thanks for that question. And, and we've discussed that. And, and we, I think that the MPC has ideas, um, but I think that our ideas are gonna be informed better, I think, but by, by your guidance, um, you know, to the extent that, that the, policy document can include items that, that are easily inserted into comment letters, that's gonna be helpful. To the extent that it's going to be, you know, if, if this is a more internal facing document rather than outwardly facing document, it, it provides an opportunity for interested parties to, to you know, hear what the, or, or better yet read, um, what the council's perspective is on certain things before they get in, involved in that. So they, 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 they can proactively plan for how to best engage with the council and the fishing communities and others who are dependent upon the, these oceans. All right, any further questions for the uh, MPC? Mr. Burden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, co-chair of the MPC, uh, for your very helpful report. My question, I, I believe, relates to what Ms. Writing was just was asking. And as I look through your presentation, which is very well done, thank you, there is a, you know, a mention of the overload, uh, quite a bit of discussion about how to go about managing that more effectively um, through you know, more regularly scheduled meetings. As I think about what we've been doing over the last few months, what occurs to me is that we're trying to be very nimble. Uh, we're trying to be responsive to a timeline that we don't have control over. This, this body is built to be deliberative and it's hard for us to be extraordinarily nimble. And I think that's creating some of the, the issues that we're trying to resolve here. And so then my, my head turns toward the policy guidance document. And what if we took a deep breath and took a step back and said, let's be very specific about what it is we think about wind energy and what we want to do in a more strategic sense. So as you think about that and maybe expanding a bit on what you just outlined, would a possible vision be that within that document, we have something that we as a council family all agree is what we think, it has the information we think should be used and things of that nature that would make us more efficient in the future, make us, speaking with a, make us speak with a more common consistent voice in the future and start to resolve some of the issues that we're having here over the last few months. I hope that question makes some sense. It, 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 it does, and, and I thank you for it. And, and I, think, I think the approach that you're presenting could definitely be helpful. Um, I, I would, I, all I would say is I would guard against becoming rigid, I think, in our approach to this. I mean, up until about a month and a half ago, we, we, we thought that that 1300 meter depth constraint was it. There was no possibility of going deeper. You know, now we have call areas off, off the East Coast that go out as far as 2,600 meters. So, you know, we have to be, we have to retain the ability to be nimble to modify this document based upon changing conditions and what we learn. But I think to the extent that, that you know, the, the approach that you're talking, I think could, it could definitely be helpful. All right, anything further for the MPC? Karen Braby. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And, and one related question that's that's really um, obvious to me, and I think the policy document is a, is a piece of this puzzle, but the other is that these timelines, these external timelines don't fit the council calendar. That's the key problem. And trying to make those mesh together is disruptive to the council process as we typically understand it. And so, um, do we need to let go of the typical council process for this particular committee and the work that's done by this committee is kind of the question that's going around in my mind. And we provided the ability for 
the MPC very intentionally to draft QR letters, even though that is not the preferred approach based on all of PFMC's history. Um, but I think it's necessary in this context. Um, and just wonder how the MPC feels about the square peg in a round hole or the reverse um, issue of these, this disconnect between the timelines and whether that kind of step a uh, leap of faith, if you will, is necessary um, from the MPC's perspective. Yeah, thank thank you very much for that question. Um, you know, one of our one of the bullet points in one of our slides talked about the QR process, and 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 we asked if that's working for you all. Um, you know, my view is is that we're here to serve you all. So if that if that works for you, um, it is challenging for us, especially when you have. But three, I think there was a time we had three public comments on, on the same day. So, and then, you know, working backwards, we want to get you something a week ahead of time. And that means we got to get something drafted internally, you know, well before then, which, which at times creates a kind time constraint, especially when it's a 30 day public comment period. So, you know, we're, we're, we, we've shown that we can do it under the, the current QR process, but, but wondered, you know, that was the point of the, the, the point that we added was wondered if that works for you all and is if you know if there's if you're in favor of, of trying something different I, I think between Carrie and myself we're and Susan and other MPC members you know we're amenable to sitting down and discussing what that could look like Bush Smith thank you mr. chair and thanks Mike um, great Great presentation, but um, something something clicked on and, and and bothered me just a little bit, and I don't think it was meant to be. But you know, this council has to be very careful that we're not sacrificing one fishery for the other. Um, what thirteen hundred fathoms means to one fisheries might be nowhere, but what it might mean to our albacore fisheries might be huge. And I think we really got to think about that when we're as a council that we're not leaving anybody behind or not sacrificing one over a group of fishermen. I just want to put a placeholder in this process because um, um, coming from a coastal community, every fishery counts and no, no one is more important than the other and all of them make us whole. And uh, I, uh, that's where I'll be coming from um, from my perspective and so i just wanted to make the uh, council aware, aware aware of that where i would be coming from in the future um uh not necessarily closed-minded but but I, i'm certainly not going to be um making choices that uh you know, that kill or hurt particular fisheries because it's it's out of the way of five but it kills one i i don't want to be in that position ever so th thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and just, just to clarify, you know, I, I wasn't suggesting that. And if, if it was interpreted that way, I, I, I just want to certainly clarify that. It's just that, you know, up until, like I said, up until about a month ago, we were told that due to technological limitations, these things couldn't go deeper than 1,300 meters. Then at that California Energy Commission workshop meeting, a developer said, yeah, that no longer applies. And then we saw the call areas off the East Coast that go out as far as 2,600 meters. Butch? Mr. Chair, and thank you. I, I wasn't suggesting that you were, but but you know you know the, the 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 booby traps you can step into when you start going down that particular road. And I, and I wasn't suggesting, oh, Mike, that you were suggesting that, but I just wanted to bring that to you know the tension. So th th thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, are there any further questions of the MPC? All right, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, we have uh, several advisory body reports. So uh, we'll start with the CPS AS, Mike Okineski. Is the light on?
on the mic. Okay, I got it. <laughs> I'm still back in the Stone Age. Excuse me one second. I'll be reading from agenda item C3A, Supplemental CPS AS Report 1, Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel Report on Marine Planning. The Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel, CPS AS, continues to be impressed and supports the important work that the Marine Planning Committee, MPC, the Habitat Committee, the Pacific Management, Fishery Management Council, and council staff are doing to monitor and protect our Pacific Ocean environment, essential habitat, ecological systems, and our fisheries from large tracts of indiscriminate ocean industry development that does not recognize the presence of a fishing industry or protection of ocean ecosystems. The fishing industry and some in the environmental community have expressed their concerns to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Industry has submitted comments to BOEM and other agencies on every available occasion and, co and has coalesced to better express these concerns to a larger audience. Much of that expressed content has been directly attributable to work the MPC and the council have undertaken. Your work is greatly appreciated. Virtually all life in the California current ecosystem is dependent on atmospheric wind energy. After reviewing the briefing book materials, the CPSAS suggests that future comment letters or documents take into account new information related to potential impacts of wind energy to CPS stocks. The CPSAS related fisheries are entirely involved in forage fish species. We sustainably harvest CPS species when cautious regulatory safeguards are met. One of these species is Pacific sardine when in the expansion cycle. When there are high volumes of sardines, they serve as major food sources for species like whales, salmon, and seabirds. As stated in our March CPSAS report, agenda item C2A, supplemental CPSA report, 1, March 2022, on MPC activities, we believe there is a potential danger that the paucity of research precludes the collection of sufficient data to determine the degree of alteration caused by wind energy generation installations to important hydrological features, such as upwelling, transport, stratification, mixing, and current strength. As cited in our March report, these transport mechanisms make it possible for larval sardine to make it over 60 miles to their inshore nursery zones. This is one specific example of how wind energy could negatively impact a high importance fishery and forage fish. Another open question is what the removal of wind energy for electrical generation would do in an El Nino, in El Nino events. It is logical to assume that when the ocean ecological system is under the stress of an El Nino, that removal of wind energy could amplify that stress, but we have, no, we have found no studies to verify this. This energy removal could have direct consequence on our fisheries and many mammalian, avian, reptilian, fin fish, and shellfish species. We offer two quotes for your consideration. Upwelling, jet separation in the California current, and these are um, footnoted. Future changes in intensity and seasonality of the wind stress curl field may similarly have a broad influence in the California current system ecosystem, being particularly important to influence the three dimensionally, dimensionality of the circulation, which ultimately controls the width of the region under the direct influence of nutrient-rich upwelled waters. Re the California current. Effect of floating offshore wind turbines on atmospheric circulation in California. Wind-driven upwelling is responsible for much of the primary productivity that sustains one of the richest ecosystems on the planet. Specific to California, 
Applied WRF, WFP, and I don't know what that stands for, to stimulate a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer wind farm offshore of Bodega Bay, California. The authors found approximately 10% reduction in wind speeds with reduction seen 100 kilometers downstream. And that concludes my report. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Are there any questions for Mike on the CPSAS report? Thank you. Uh, now we'll get the uh, GAP report, and I understand that Dan Waldeck will be reading that. Dan? Welcome. I will. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. You can hear me, yes? Indeed. Thank you. Dan Waldeck with the GAP. I'll be reading our report on marine planning, agenda item C3. The GAP reviewed briefing book materials related to this agenda item and received a summary of the recent Marine, P marine Planning Committee meeting from Mr. Kerry Griffin, Council Staff, and Ms. Susan Chambers, MPC Co-Chair. The GAP appreciates the extensive review provided by the MPC on several topics, which are detailed in their supplemental report. The GAP supports all of the recommendations made by the MPC in their report. In addition to the information provided by the MPC, the Council should be aware of recent activities by fishing industry participants, coastal communities, state legislators, and the tribes related to offshore wind development. These activities have included public listening sessions with Oregon state legislators, development of port and commu coastal community resolutions documenting concerns about offshore wind and effects on fisheries, fishing communities, and the marine environment, and expression of tribal concerns about offshore wind and effects on treaty fishing access, rights, and resources. Public engagement efforts related to the proposed Oregon call areas are being led by Ms. Heather Mann, Midwater Trawlers Cooperative, in coordination with Ms. Lori Steele, West Coast Seafood Process Association, Ms. Yelena Nowak, Oregon Trawl Commission, and Mr. Dan Waldeck, Pacific Whiting Conservation Cooperative, and many others. The common message is that offshore wind will severely and negatively impact Pacific Coast fisheries, fishing dependent communities, critically important fishery science, and the marine environment. The request is for BOEM to slow down the offshore wind development process because public engagement needs to be meaningful and environmental and economic analyses are needed prior to definition of call areas and certainly before wind energy areas are identified and leases are requested. Again, focusing on new information that the council should be aware of, the MTC website provides access to digital versions of letters and resolutions from local, state, and tribal governments to BOEM. These documents express reservations about the current BOEM process for, de for developing offshore wind and concerns about impacts to fisheries and coastal communities. Moreover, the GAP understands that other local communities and municipalities will take up similar resolutions in advance of the June 28th Oregon Call Area Public Comment deadline. The GAP then provides several quotes from these recent letters. The Oregon Coastal Caucus, a bipartisan group of legislators that represents coastal districts, quote, slow down the process to better understand the risks and uncertainties to the ecosystem, economics, and coastal communities. Over 600 citizens representing the seafood industry, ocean users, environmental groups, and other stakeholders participated in our recent listening sessions. Clearly, there is broad interest and a need to better hear these concerns, unquote. Port of Newport, quote, enact a moratorium on developing large-scale wind turbine farms until all the risks to marine mammals, seabirds, fisheries, and the marine environment are clearly understood, unquote. City of Newport, quote, given the considerable values generated from the call areas, the productivity of the California current system, and the potential impacts to marine species and ecosystems habitats, the process should be slowed down because of the significant risks and uncertainties, unquote. Quinault Indian Nation, quote, the nation strongly opposes the unsolicited lease request by Trident Winds for a site to develop a floating offshore wind project, Olympic Wind, off the coast of Grace Harbor, Washington. This proposed project will severely impact the nation's treaty fishing access rights and resources, unquote. Grays Harbor County Board of County Commissioners, quote, the Grays Harbor County Board of County Commissioners opposes the Trident Wind Project, Olympic Wind. The Olympic Wind Project has submitted the Olympic Wind Project has submitted an unsolicited lease request to develop a floating wind project off the coast of Grace Harbor, Washington. The Quinault Indian Nation states this project will severely impact the nation's treaty, which secures fishing access, certain rights, and resources. 
equally as important are the many local businesses, employees, and communities that will be adversely affected by this project, unquote. As further evidence of the need to slow the process down in order to fully understand the range and scope of potential impacts, the gap highlights NIMF's findings relative to fishery science. In their report under agenda item F1B, NIMF stated, if the West Coast Bottom Trawl Survey was precluded from sampling in Oregon offshore wind areas, for some species, quote, we would expect assessment uncertainty to increase throughout much of the existing survey period with the potential for unpredictable changes in population scale or status, unquote. NIMF further states, quote, were the, Pacific Hakes, were the Pacific Hakes survey to be excluded from the offshore wind area, the assessment would suffer a substantial information loss, unquote. To again highlight common themes, offshore wind development will have negative impacts. Those impacts need to be understood and analyzed, and BOEM should slow down because of these significant risks, risks and uncertainties. Therefore, the GAP recommendation to the Council is simple and straightforward. Please add your voice to this groundswell of concern by clearly articulating to BOEM that you share the concerns expressed by the Council family and local, state, and tribal government representatives that offshore wind will harm fisheries, fishing-dependent communities, and the marine environment. The GAP recommends the Council request BOEM slow down the offshore wind development process because we need to fully understand the potential harm, risks, and uncertainties to Council-managed to council fisheries and the marine environment now, not later. That ends the GAP report, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dan. Are there questions on the GAP report? Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. We'll now hear from the Habitat Committee, Corey Green. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the council. I'm gonna be reading agenda item C.3.A, Supplemental Habitat Committee Report 1, Habitat Committee Report on Marine Planning. The first item is California Coastal Zone Management Act decision on wind energy areas, critical step in the federal regulatory process for offshore wind is that the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management must demonstrate that the activity is consistent with the state's federally approved coastal zone management program and the state's enforceable policies. Bohm submitted a determination of consistency for the Humboldt wind energy area for the site characterization and site assessment activities phase of the process. In its review of BOEM's CD, the California Coastal Commission concluded that because it is for reasonably foreseeable that offshore wind leases will lead to construction and operation of offshore wind facilities, it is also reasonable to expect that potential related impacts on coastal resources should also be described and analyzed for consistency to the extent possible. The California Coastal Commission issued a conditional concurrence, i.e. approval, for the activities provided the following conditions are met. First, coordinated survey plans, including marine wildlife protection and monitoring measures, spill plans at sea containment plan, anchoring plan. Second, no bottom contact with hard substrate or coral sponge habitat and include buffer that fully protects these habitats. Third, minimize risk of vessel strikes. Four, ensure safe navigation. Five, engagement with local communities. Six, engagement with tribes. And seven, to address impacts to fishing and fishing communities, leases must have a fisheries liaison and develop a working group involving fishery industry and state and federal agencies. As noted in the Marine Planning Committee supplemental report, on June 8th, 2022, the California Coastal Commission discussed the Morro Bay, WIA, CD, and the Coastal Commission staff report. The Coastal Commission approved the CD unanimously and applied the same rationale and conditions in their concurrent decision, concurrence decision as the recent Humboldt WIA, CD. All right, the next item is the California Offshore Wind Public Sale Notice. On a related topic, the Habitat Committee supports the Council drafting a letter on the California Offshore Wind Public Sale Notice. 
as mentioned in the MPC supplemental report, and the HC is prepared to assist. Next is the Oregon call areas. The habitat committee discussed the council's draft comment letter to BOEM on off Oregon offshore wind call areas. The MPC's well-developed letter provides the necessary background information and details the council's specific concerns with the current BOEM process necessary for an initial understanding of the potential impacts of developing offshore wind facilities. The HC has additional edits for consideration noted below. In addition, the HC anticipates providing a track changes version to the letter to the letter of the letter to council staff. The comments are as follows. Information needs and impact assessment needs regarding the fishery resources itself, i.e. fish species, need further development. Secondly, the recommendation for a comprehensive suitability analysis would be better termed geospatial compatibility analysis to better capture the intent, which is that the analysis consider the comp compatibility of offshore wind with existing ecological resources and uses. And third, the recommendation for a comprehensive cumulative impacts assessment should explain the need for a cumulative effects analysis of the activities associated with each phase of BOEM's process, in addition to impacts from construction operation of multiple wind farms. Next item is the offshore development guidance document. The HC previously provided some recommended edits for consideration in the guidance document, which are included in the supplemental MPC report. During the HC meeting discussion of this agenda item, the HC identified additional issues for consideration. These are briefly summarized as follows. At a scope section that explains that this guidance document is a living document and is currently primarily focused on offshore wind. While many of the issues identified apply to other ocean industries, such as aquaculture and oil rig decommissioning, there are other issues specific to those industries not identified in this document that should be added later. The stated objectives do not speak directly to the purpose statement of the guidance document, but rather are the Council Fisheries, Council's fisheries management responsibilities. The objectives header should be moved to the third paragraph that begins with the intent of this guidance is to and so forth and the council's management responsibilities should be labeled as such consistent with the magnuson stevens fisheries conservation and management act correct the term fishery resources throughout the document to clarify that this term means fish species to distinguish from impacts to the fishing community Additional cleanup of recommendations that are either conflicting or redundant that can be ad addressed in the next draft, such as buffering habitat areas of particular concern versus explicitly avoiding those habitat areas of particular concern. With the placement of weas and lease sales and cleanup of essential fish habitat language regarding methane seeps. Include discussion of issues that affect shoreline and estuarine habitats from offshore industry activities, such as expansion of port facilities for assembly, transport, and management and maintenance of offshore wind structures. The last item is the NOAA aquaculture opportunity areas. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has requested input on potential impacts to EFH in its notice of intent to prepare a programmatic environmental impact statement on offshore aquaculture opportunity areas. The public comment period ends July 22nd, 2022. The MPC recommended that the HC and MPC collaborate on a comment letter for council consideration via the quick response procedure after the June meeting, focusing on potential habitat and fishery impacts and on any missing or incorrect elements in the AOA Atlas for Southern California. The HC agreed to collaborate with the MPC on a quick response letter. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the Habitat Committee? Karen Brady. Uh, thank you, um, Chair, and thank you, Corey, for the report. 
I, I also want to acknowledge the Habitat Committee and your heavy lifting on a lot of the Marine Planning um, Committee work, um, really contributing a lot to those letters. So thank you uh, for that work. Um, and uh, I hope it continues um, and look forward to more council discussion on that today. Um, I want to ask you a similar question as I asked uh, Mike Conroy uh, about the process of developing letters um, with a um, really just an intent to, to hear some additional detail about how the Habitat Committee might um, uh, guide us in, in suggesting how to streamline the process to try and help with the workload issue and the and the coordination issue. Is there anything that you can provide to us um, from Habitat Committee conversations that could help help us today? Well, I think I can I maybe offer a couple of insights. The first is about sort of has to deal with um, this guidance document we were putting together and whether some of that can be brought to bear on many of these letters as it's fleshed out. Um, that would that would substantially reduce the workload if it could be used uh, as pieces to fill in some of these um, letters we send out. Second uh, piece, I think, uh, concerns sort of the overall workload and coordination with other advisory bodies on that workload. And um, I mean, it, it, it might serve the council to pick and choose not only sort of which letters that they, do, that they do, but also sort of who takes the lead on these letters. Um, and that might streamline getting those completed in an orderly fashion. Any uh, further questions of the Habitat Committee? Thank you very much, Corey. Thank you. All right. A familiar face, Mike Conroy, with the HMSAS report. Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Mike Conroy. I am a member of the Highly Migratory Species Advisory Subpanel and I will not be reading our report. I am just going to briefly summarize as I'm sure you are tired of hearing me speak at this point in time. Um, like the CPSAS, we greatly appreciate the Marine Planning Committee and the Council's work in this space. Um, specific to the Oregon draft call area comment letter, uh, the albacore fishery reps on the AS agree with the draft comment letters, highlighting the albacore fishery as one which operates in or near the call area and that the albacore fishery is important to both commercial and recreational fisheries that are based in central and southern Oregon, as well as to those vessels that are based in California and or Washington, which participate in that fishery. Um, we suggest that BOEM consider reissuing call areas and waters deeper than 1300 meters, 700 fathoms, um, as we noted in our March of 2022 report, prime fishing grounds for HMS fisheries exist in those waters. Um, in the current call or future, any future call areas, we recommend that uh, there be a 15 mile buffer around seamount ridges and canyons, those areas which typically um, foster habitat and, and good prime fishing grounds for HMS fisheries. Um, with regard to the proposed sale notice, we support the council drafting a comment letter to be submitted through the QR process. And in terms of the AOAs, uh, we don't expect any direct conflicts with HMS fisheries, but the members of the HMSAS that are based in and around Southern California would, would hope that the council remain engaged and participate in that process. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for that summary. Are there any questions of the HMSAS? Uh, not seeing any hands. Thanks very much, Mike. So I believe that uh, completes um, all of our reports. It would take us to public comment. Is there an interest in taking a break at this time or should we start? There is an interest in taking a break. So we will take a break uh, until 2.40. 
and we'll come back, we'll take public comment, and then we'll carry on as we would, as we need to do with council discussion and action. So 240.
All right, let's uh, grab our seats and we'll get started. In the meantime, I'll ask all of those who have signed up for public comment, and there are four of you, to uh, raise your hands to uh, make it to facilitate our enabling your microphone. Are you asking me to begin? <laughs> we're we're going to get started here in a second here, and I'll call on the okay. thank you presenters one at a time. So was that you, Larry? It was yes. Okay, Larry, please go ahead. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. Good afternoon. My name is Larry Thievik. I am the president of the Washington Dungeness Crab Fishermen's Association, the WDCFA, headquartered in Westport, Washington. The Dungeness crab fishery is sustainable and is the most valuable single species fishery on the West Coast. While this council is entrusted to manage and speak for federal fisheries, the role this council provides in communications to BOEM is critically important to all West Coast fisheries, whether federally managed or not. I appreciate the recognition in MPC, MPC draft letters how important state managed fisheries are and that in conjunction with council managed fisheries are necessary and additive to the economic success and resilience of all West Coast fishing activities and fishing communities. It is imperative the council continues to remind BOEM of that truth and continue to provide a conduit for the broader discussions of offshore wind development impacts on behalf of all West Coast fisheries and existing ocean users. users. WDCFA supports the comments in the MPC draft letter and comments from other advisory bodies to the Council on the Oregon call and on policy recommendations. I remind the Council once again that the foundational principle of the Council's position was stated in a message to BOEM shortly after the formation of the MPC, and I quote, that the direct and indirect effects of wind energy areas on fisheries, habitats, and ecological resources should inform all wind energy scoping process and must do so in advance of leasing, permitting, and construction phases of wind energy development, unquote. That statement is especially resonant now as the potential cumulative impacts of multiple project developments on the California current system have gained elevated attention and elevated scrutiny. The lack of pre-lease analysis of potential cumulative unintended negative impacts above all else should signal to BOEM the need to provide a programmatic EIS prior to leasing public ocean space to private developers and to heed the repeated call from numerous and diverse sources, including the MPC and other advisory panels to this council to slow this process down. Slow down until data catches up to decisions. As we have all learned over time, actions occurring off of one coastal state usually have impacts in all coastal states. The development of OSW and the amount of ocean space to displace for proposed project development will have significant and long-lasting impacts on fishing, fishing communities, support industries, and other species that share ocean space with us along the entire West Coast. What we have also learned is BOEM has little knowledge or care to understand potential negative impacts prior to leasing. BOEM continues to proceed with a permit process that essentially leases first and asks questions later. Fishers, other stakeholders, concerned members of the public, and this council must insist BOEM conduct more thorough environmental reviews of adverse impacts at project level and at a cumulative level prior to call area designations and leasing and must do so in order to meet BOEM's charge and professed goal to develop OSW on the OCS with minimal or no impacts on existing uses or the ocean environment. 
A bomb lease grant will be especially egregious if granted on the base of cursory environmental assessments and broad call area delineations with limited scope and limited analysis of environmental and stakeholder interest and impacts. It is one thing that Bohm claims an open stakeholder input process. It is quite another for Bohm to alter course or act on the basis of those inputs. The disparity between data gaps and analysis and what seems a predetermined and arbitrary decision timeline for Bohm action continues to haunt this present process and deeply concern stakeholders and members of the public. An analysis of the cumulative effects of multiple OSW developments at scale and expected range of displacement and effects on present ocean uses on marine and avian species and potential impact on upwelling nutrient distribution and the California current system is simply unacceptably missing in action in Bohm's present lease process. I understand the analysis of specific and cumulative project impacts is a daunting task. But for those of us facing daunting impacts on our livelihoods, communities, and resources that we depend on, it is a justifiable and necessary, necessary one. Unfortunately, that task, from what I have seen, is not one Bohm will rise to meet unless we as stakeholders, policymakers, managers, ocean and marine species advocates demand that they do. And I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Larry, are there any questions of Larry? Corey Niles. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Hi, Larry, thanks for being here. Um, and um, thank you for listening closely to your thoughts there, I guess bouncing around in my mind and you know you you and I will be talking about this in a in a different forum on Wednesday at the WICMAC but you know I, from Bohm we've heard a willingness to do better with the process um, and I'm wondering how we do better so in in you know maybe an unfair question for you right now but if you had a response you know what would you say is the important things that that we Bohm could do better in terms of engaging uh, the fishing communities? Well, in Washington, now that we are confronted with an unsolicited lease request, um, a bomb could expand what is considered a potential task force formation in Washington to include stakeholder direct participation in the task force. That might be something that would be helpful in the case of Washington. Uh, we have task force already formed in other states. There's probably no room for any stakeholders on those or, or a, a process to get them on the task force. But I think that would be helpful in Washington. I think one of the things that has become pretty obvious to me is there have been claims of an open stakeholder input opportunities. But frankly, and Dr. Braby mentioned this as well, you know, there's been oftentimes many considered inputs, but not too much in the way of considered responses in some in in cases of, you know, where a catalog of concerns is presented. And yet there as of yet has been little reflection of those concerns in, in Bloom decisions, specifically slowing down this process. Uh, I, I think that's, I hope that helps give you some perspective from my my point of view. A rushed answer. Thanks, thanks, Larry. Appreciate it. And I uh, look forward to, to talking with you on Wednesday. Yeah, thanks, Corey. All right, any uh, further questions uh, for Larry? All right, thank you very much, Larry. Uh, next. Uh, we have Mike Okunevsky. Welcome back, Mike.
Right. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chair and Council Members. For the record, my name is Mike Okineski. I'm representing the West Coast Pelagic Conservation Group. Some baseline questions for Bohm and the Council to consider. After Bohm has winnowed down a call area, does the balance which was not leased stay on the books as active or reserved for future consideration? There are several ways that might happen. Interested parties might make an unsolicited request for a lease on the unleased area in the call. It might go into moratorium that could be reactivated later. Or they may just go through a new call area process for the area they chose not to offer out the first time. This would be a major issue for fishermen, processors, and lending institutions in relation to investment in future assets or repairs due to the uncertainty factor. Next question, or, uh, question, what physical and other qualifications would a port and community need to participate in the turbine assembly and the maintenance operations phase, i.e. draft and width of channel? What would they need and what would disqualify a, court, a port from being in contention? Number three, if a port does not qualify to receive offshore wind energy jobs and offshore wind energy related business, what will be done to compensate the communities, fishermen and processors for the loss of fishing related employment and support business? Number four, it was stated at a BOEM meeting that there is research being conducted at an NREL lab on the effects, effects of offshore wind energy to ocean hydrological and ecological systems from wind energy reductions downwind of the turbines, i.e. wind wakes, upwelling, et cetera. What progress is being made on this research? Can we talk directly to people at the lab on the research? Number five, with your expressed concerns on ocean hydrological and ecological function and the findings in the four mentioned studies and potential effects of wind farms interacting with key components of a California current, are there any plans to implement a programmatic, EI, programmatic EISs before leasing as opposed to an EA? These EAs have received much criticism from the fishing industry and certain NGOs about their lack of depth and their scope to achieve any meaningful analysis. That concludes my testimony. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Mike. Are there questions of Mike? Bush Smith. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think, yes, yes, uh, comment. Then nice testimony. Um, Mike, I, um, you know, you said something that uh, really piqued my attention is, you know, if there's some kind of uh, money for lost fishing grounds, um, you know, you, you, it, it's real important. It's, it's just not the, the fishermen that we lose, but, you know, it's the cannery worker and it's the net shop and it's the hotel and it's the restaurant you know it's we're all connected there and and uh to make sure bone realizes in your testimony that it's you know just not paying a fisherman for lost fishing grounds it's everybody in the chain that loses when a, a fisherman's unable to fish and i i think that's very important to remember and and keep pressed upon uh bone that uh you know, truly fishing communities are connected from from the, the little anchovy we use to the, the the big boats and engines that we have. And so I think that's very important and everybody in between. So thank, thank you for that testimony, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through the chair, I'm, I'm sorry, Blitz, but my hearing is terrible. So could you, if it's a question in there, could you repeat it a little louder, please? There, there wasn't a question, but it was a statement to make sure that you keep sending that message that it's just not the the boat that, that needs to be paid for the lost fishing grounds. It's everybody that supports those boats in our communities that, that should be considered uh, if, if it comes you. to that, so. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Butch, for the question. Um, I couldn't have said it any better, Butch. I mean, it, we've uh, attempted to get that message out 
to Boehm and almost everybody else that attends any of the meetings we've been going to. There's there's far more to it than just the, the first line of activity in, in the fishing sector, um, just fishermen. And every everybody's got a dog in the fight, you might say, in these fishing communities, uh, schools, uh, you know, social services and all of that. So, but the businesses have invested their own money in many cases, such as England Marine, there have been a lot of our meetings. And uh, like I say, you've framed it up very well. So thank you. All right, thanks very much. Any further questions for Mike? Thank you. All right. Um, Heather Mann, welcome, Heather. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, council members, my name's Heather Mann. I'm the executive director for the Midwaters, uh, Midwater Trawlers Cooperative. Um, but over the last several months, I've been working with a large coalition of interests that includes commercial and recreational fishermen, processors, marine suppliers, scientists, ENGOs, uh, coastal municipalities, and the public who all have serious concerns about the placement of offshore wind farms off our coast. My reason for testifying today is simple, a plea to the council to stay genuinely engaged in the BOEM process. I'm aware there are concerns about the time required to authentically engage, but frankly, if there ever was a time where the council could bring their collective technical expertise, vast knowledge, fisheries and habitat, management responsibility, all of that to the table, it's now. In more than 25 years in the fishery management process, it's my strong belief that offshore wind is one of the largest threats, not just to fisheries, but to the ocean environment and the marine life within it. The narrative that offshore wind impacts are nothing compared to the impacts of climate change, which implies collateral damage is expected and accepted, is dangerous because it stops good intentioned people from peeling back the layers and examining what the impacts from offshore wind could be, because they don't want to appear as if they are against renewable energy. This may be why we've not seen as many ENGOs step up and point out the potential negative impacts, and I applaud the groups that have started getting involved. In particular, local Audubon groups and Oceana have provided excellent comments to the process. I'm hopeful other ENGOs will follow their lead, resolve whatever internal tensions they have, and publicly state their concerns with the rush to offshore wind. The BOEM process is set up for two things and two things only, to privatize and then industrialize the ocean, regardless of the impacts to stakeholders or the environment. As one BOEM employee said in a recent meeting, quote, we just leased land, end quote. The process is set up by design to result in leased land. BOEM gives excuses for why they cannot do in-depth studies up front. Their pretext is that they do not know what the construction plans for the farms will actually look like or what technology would be used, so it's premature. Can you imagine the council recommending and NIMF supporting a process that had opened up the trawl RCA first and then done studies? or even now opening up the non-trawl RCA without any analysis? Of course not. Actions like that would never happen because the importance of the marine habitat and ecosystem is the priority. Unfortunately, BOEM does not see it that way. So it's the job of all of us to hold BOEM accountable for their process and their actions. There are only three main types of floating technology that could be utilized. The turbines have to be connected to each other and then further connected to a substation, and then the power needs to be transmitted to shore. Protesting that there's not enough information to do a thorough upfront analysis is disingenuous at best. The reason BOEM does not do an upfront analysis is because lands would likely never be leased because the projected impacts would be too great. BOEM has never denied a project at the late stage environmental review. And BOEM clearly accepts major impacts to marine ecosystems, marine life, and fishermen as acceptable outcomes to getting leases issued. 
Just read the Vineyard Wind decision document and it's there clearly in black and white. Well, actually it's there in yellow and orange, like a bright blinking warning light, which was ignored. And that's probably why there's at least four lawsuits pending. The council must stay engaged in this process because the two call areas off Oregon are prime fishing grounds for so many different species. Hundreds of millions of pounds of whiting alone have been harvested from these two areas. And that's just one species, a species that plays a major part in food security for millions of people. A species that contributes considerable revenue to coastal communities and those businesses who rely on the whiting fleet. Being displaced from any part of these call areas will have a major impact on the whiting industry. There's no question about that. But I agree with Butch, all fisheries matter. The trawl non-whiting sector will suffer. I would ask you guys to think about everything that the trawl industry in general has sacrificed to get where we are today. Certified sustainable ground fish fisheries, the RCAs, areas closed for 20 plus years, collaboration from the trawl industry to increase, e increase EFH, create more closures. On top of that, voluntary closures of thousands of square miles in the whiting sectors to minimize incidental catch. And the buyback loan, the gorilla in the room, the trawl sector took the initiative to reduce capacity, but we bear the full brunt of that. An action which we're, we've paid $42.5 million on and still owe $11 million more. All of these actions were done and are continuing to be done with the expectation of being able to fish sustainably into the future. These are all being sacrificed and undermined by the BOEM process. And that goes for every gear group and every species and gear type. The council has to stay involved because if you take the impact to commercial and recreational fishing out of the equation, the known and unknown risks to the environment, to birds, marine mammals, habitat, the ecosystem, it's just too great. I've learned more than I ever wanted to learn about turbines. I cannot fathom why anyone in their right mind would be rushing with blinders into this process, unless it's for a piece of the obscene amount of money that's being thrown around. And I'll add money being used to try to divide and conquer the industry and others. The stories of offshore wind developers trying to buy off individuals are swirling everywhere. We're up against a multinational corporate machine we can't compete with. The council must stay involved. Look, this is not about denying there is a climate crisis. It's not about denying the need to move away from fossil fuels. I'm a mom, I care about the environment. This is about ensuring we do not create one environmental catastrophe or impact food security while trying to solve the climate crisis with an untested technology. Maybe it's out of sight, out of mind, so people don't recognize the danger. But the council needs to be involved and tell that story. Of the 50 comments already submitted to BOEM on the Oregon areas, four were in blind support. 46 are voicing strong concerns about the process, the location, whales, birds, fish, fishing. At the listening sessions up and down the coast, letters to Odo, hundreds of people have voiced those concerns. The small group of people in blind support of offshore wind all stand to make money off it. It's important to offer solutions and the information is there if people only take the time to look. NREL has reported more than once about Oregon's massive capacity to expand onshore wind and solar energy generation, energy that's less expensive to implement, less expensive for the consumer. If we really care about the environment and doing something about the crisis, we should be focusing on things we know what the risks are, what the impacts are, and things we can do quickly. And as I conclude, Mr. Chairman, I want to relay two things. An offshore wind advocate stated that if a fisherman loses their job, they can get a new one, ferrying people and supplies to and from wind farms. Not only is this deeply offensive, it's representative of many who don't understand fishing. It certainly reflects thinking from people, some people in urban areas, who when they think about seafood, it's you know what's for dinner. 
it's not about the fact that it's a, a economic generator for the whole coast. So please stay meaningfully involved. We are all carrying heavier workloads, that, workloads than we anticipated related to offshore wind. Please use stronger language in your letter and strongly urge BOEM to slow down this process, suspend their current activities until an environmental and economic analysis that would pass council and NIMPS requirements is completed. So real impacts, including cumulative, cumulative impacts can be known. Respectfully, you can have an impact on this process if you stand up to it and add your voice to the many others as requested by the GAP. The requested slow down allows the council, the Marine Planning Committee, allows everybody to take the time they need to provide the information. The policy document is important, but many of us agree it's secondary to firm council engagement with BOEM, and I would ask that you don't lose focus. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and council members. Thank you very much, Heather, for your comment. We'll look to see if there are any questions. Brad Pettinger, Vice Chair. Yeah, Heather, thanks for some great uh, testimony there. Um, you know, we've, we've got the MPC and they've been working on it the last year or so. Um, you understand the council process. Um, last few months, uh, the industry has kicked in and done some amazing work. And I see your emails and uh, blows me away to all the work that's getting done and, and the, the, the results you've gotten. Um, certainly want to be engaged, but uh, from where, from your point of view, well, from my point of view, I, I would hate to, for us to get in your way, number one, um, because I don't want to slow down what uh, the industry is doing outside of the council process. But do you see any way to that the council could do a better job um, understanding, you know, on how on how the council works, the process there? Um, have you given any thought to that as far as how we could better help uh, and assist you um, in your endeavors? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Brad, thanks for that question. Um, absolutely. I think while I appreciate, um, you know, not wanting to undermine or get in the way of all the other activities, um, I actually think at this point, the more the better. Um, and it's not that it's just send letters to send letters. You know, the industry we have to prove to BOEM that we use these fishing areas, right? So uh, we're like getting sea state and showing our track lines and plotting every, you know, they don't have to prove to us anything, but we need to prove to them. And for some reason, as happens a lot of the time, the industry providing the information is different than National Marine Fishery Service, ODFW, or the Pacific Fishery Management Council. I think that having the credibility of being a council that is very conservative, very precautionary, very thoughtful, providing input into this process is really important. The second part of that is that at the CCC meeting, um, which you were at, and I was listening in, you know, um, Janet Coit talked about just the the amount of pressure on NIMPS to be able to meaningfully engage on the offshore wind activities and provide input and the lack of resources to do that. And that same day, I read an article where BOEM was demanding more money so that they could fast track more, more leases getting out there. And those two things are not compatible. And if NIMPS is not able to do this, and we know BOEM is not doing an adequate job of analyzing and identifying impacts, I really feel like the council doing that, whether it's lending support to what you're hearing or, or even just ground truthing what industry is providing, um, I don't wanna create a whole bunch of additional work, but I really feel like the voice of a very credible council and the Pacific Council is, is absolutely critical. And I also think offshore wind is coming to every place that they can get away with it, whether it's Alaska, Hawaii, other parts of the United States outside the, the Northeast. This council has a real opportunity to change the dynamic with BOEM and really 
set an example and a model that others can learn from and use as well. So those are my immediate thoughts on that question. I hope that helps, Fred. Uh, it, it did. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, further questions for Heather? John Ugritz? Or excuse me. Bob Dooley, welcome. But again, a little rusty. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Thanks, Heather, for the great testimony. I have a question for you. Um, I'll kind of couch it a little bit first. You know, we, we participate in a lot of common uh, arenas and nationally as well as locally on this issue. And I'm wondering if, if you have seen anything from the East Coast who seems like they're far ahead of us in, 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 in farther down the line on this wind energy thing. Are there any inroads that they have made that maybe the council could emulate to get ahead of this game? Are there things that they have done maybe that we haven't thought about yet or haven't uncovered that you know about with our, you know, with our common friends on the East Coast that have been involved with this for a, quite a while and feeling the brunt of it. So I'm just, I'm just curious if there's anything you can offer that we might, uh, might think about and that the council could help on other than what you've already illustrated. So thanks again, Heather, for the great testimony. Uh, through the chairman, Bob, uh, thanks for the question. You know, I, uh, I'm on the board of Seafood Harvesters, as, as you are, uh, which is a national organization, and we have been, you know, collaborating with colleagues on the East Coast who are much further ahead. In one sense, we're learning from the things that they didn't do or, or that didn't work, and that has been helpful. Um, but I, I guess a couple answers parts to the answer. And the first is, it's like watch, it's almost like watching a car accident, like in slow motion and wanting to do something different, but finding yourself kind of sometimes in the same position because, you know, Bohm came out here saying, we want to do things different than New England. We're going to listen to you and we're going to collaborate, but that hasn't, that hasn't happened. Um, and we can name, you know, multiple times that that hasn't happened. Just hosting meetings is not it. And so what I'm learning from the East Coast and particularly in Maine is that with enough pushback and enough collaboration among different groups pushing back, which we certainly have, you know, a, a variety of groups on the West Coast, that you can funnel this into a more productive step forward. And that is, you know, off Main, they're doing a small, I think it's 12 square miles, uh, research test type thing for uh, wind energy, um, you know, testing the turbines and whatnot. And that's the path that Maine has chosen. And that's the path I'm really pushing the state of Oregon. Who, and I think we have an opportunity with Oregon to get there. I'm not sure about Washington, and I'm not sure about California, but there are ways to still move forward with this renewable energy in a smart way. And I think Maine has given me a lot um, to think about and learn from, um, but it takes a lot of people all pulling in the same direction because BOEM is not required, as everybody knows, to, to interact with us the way that um, National Marine Fisheries is, for example. Decisions are made in secret there. Um, so not in this process like you'll have this afternoon after public comment where everybody can hear it. So I think learning from Maine is, is really good. Um, I've also been learning a lot from uh, the Great Lakes, which sounds odd, but they want to put a bunch of turbines in Lake Erie. I mean, this is an issue that's going around, on all around, uh, and that's not a BOEM issue, but it's it still has a lot of the same themes. Um, and unfortunately, all these concerns, especially on the East Coast, they're just kind of swamped by, well, we need to get to renewable energy. We need to get to renewable energy. And I think that's part of what happened on the East Coast. And I really think that on the West Coast, we need to stand up to that. Um, so that's kind of the other thing I would say, I guess, is that there's not a lot of success 
that they from things that they've tried on the East Coast. And so again, we're learning from really, really great efforts that haven't produced the results that we'd like to see, which makes which makes collaborating with BOEM all the more daunting, frankly. Um, so I hope that sort of gets to your answer, Bob. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, can, I, can I follow up with a, a second? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I mean, one, one just kind of digging a little deeper. Are you aware of any, any um, input or influence or uh, work that's being done by other councils that might help that we should be doing that that other than what you've already outlined is there is there anything specific that maybe they have they are doing that might be getting some successful uh, reaction to or or or, or not uh, mr. chairman Bob I actually I'm not aware. That doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, I've been really, really focused um, on the West Coast and on this council process. Um, but if you're aware of something, I'd love to know. Um, I'm not aware of anything uh, at this particular time. But again, that doesn't mean there isn't something that's happening. And I'm I'm just negligent and not having um, discovered it yet. Oh, no. And I, I hopefully... Um, our executive committee that coming from the CCC might have some knowledge in that later, but I, I just. Bush Smith. So Heather, great, great testimony and, and nice to hear your voice again. Um, you know, I, I asked Mike this question and, and this kind of dirty the waters when LNG tried to come into Astoria or Warrington and you know spread some money around and 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 what 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 are you hearing um you know I'm hearing a lot of stuff on the street about and I think you mentioned the spreading money around and trying to buy people's loyalty or what what or you know just compensating what 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 are you what are you hearing down in your neck in the woods on that subject? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Butch, uh, thanks for the question. I think compensation for uh, lost fishing opportunity, that is something that has been um, talked about a lot on the East Coast. And there is a, a, a group in California of fishermen that's actually supportive of, of this. And I think it's really important to get it on the record that um, the group of fishermen in Northern California is they're not trawlers. They're not, uh, you know, large operating vessels. I mean, uh, many of them are, are skiff fishermen or s maybe there's somebody who, you know, can be, I'm not saying bought off, but bought out. They're at the end of their career and they see that they have an opportunity to retire. You know, I'm not going to blame them for that, but they don't speak for the majority of the commercial fishing industry and I have no idea how you put a value on a trawl fisherman, uh, a Justin Johnson, a, a Chris Cooper, who's 40 years old. He bought this business as a multi-generational fishing family. So from his dad and granddad has 20 more years of fishing and all that he has sacrificed to get here. How do you value everything he's paid to the buyback load? How do you value all the future earnings potentially of that vessel? Um, I think compensation for lost fishing grounds uh, is, is a non-starter for people that are truly involved in fishing, who wanna keep fishing, who were supplying food the commercial industry is providing food to the nation and the world. Um, so just buying people out does not solve the problem. It also doesn't solve any of the environmental problems, you know, so that's another thing. And then the other component is throwing money at research. And I am 100% convinced that some of the people on the East Coast have stopped sharing their concerns because they've had money thrown at them for their research whether it's about whales or something else, birds, whatever. Um, but none of this research is actually coming to fruition before decisions are made. So OSU last year got $2 million, I believe, 
to study the impacts of offshore wind, the study won't be done for four years. The leases are going to be out before then. Like there's not a match up there. So they're throwing money at people to get them to stop pushing back and instead, you know, do their research, but they're not waiting for the research to be done. Um, and the last thing I'll say about compensation is the most la the latest thing we're hearing is that the offshore wind companies, and I've read it in the comments to Bohm, the offshore wind companies think that the money that's used for any of this compensation should actually come out of the lease fees that they're paying to the treasury, not above and beyond what they would have to pay to the treasury anyway. And to me, you know, that's BS. So that's my response. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Heather. Further questions for Heather? All right, thank you very much, Heather. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And now we'll hear from Lori Still, Lori Steele, uh, formerly in person and now remote. Welcome, Lori. Thank you um, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lori Steele and I'm the executive director of the West Coast Seafood Processors Association. Um, I'm going to be very brief uh, and echo and support all of the comments you've already heard during public testimony. Um, I've been working uh, with Heather and several of our other um, industry friends and colleagues to try to get a handle on this issue and I fully support everything that Heather just said. Um, I really, I wanted to take a quick minute to um, say thank you to the council and the Marine Planning Committee. I really appreciate the work of the council on this issue. Um, a lot of great work has been done obviously and we need to continue this momentum. I cannot emphasize the importance of this issue and the urgency for the council to stay for the associated with the need for the council to stay actively engaged right now. This is a critical time in this process. It's crazy to look at how much has happened over the last year. And now is when we really need the council and NIMS to, to push this issue with BOEM as much as possible. I think it's critically important for the council to demand that BOEM formally respond to the concerns expressed by the council regarding the potential impacts of offshore wind development on fisheries, on our ecosystem, and on our science and management. I would encourage the council to request formal written responses to the questions raised and the concerns identified in your letters to BOEM. From my, from my understanding, we've we've seen no response from BOEM to any of the letters um, that we've submitted. Um, so I would ask that you ask for written response. And in the letter on the Oregon call areas, I encourage the council to specifically demand that BOEM slow down the process so we can all fully evaluate and understand the impacts of offshore wind development. I certainly understand the concerns associated with time and bandwidth and resources right now. These are challenges we are all facing. The industry is certainly facing them too. Um, to, to say that this last year has been overwhelming um, is a great understatement. Um, but right now we're in an all hands on deck type situation. And we need the council and NIMS to demand that BOEM slow down, listen, and find a path forward that includes collaboration and comprehensive evaluation of impacts. I strongly encourage the council to hold BOEM accountable for their process and their actions. Please urge BOEM to slow down. Please ask the important questions and the hard questions, and please demand written responses from BOEM. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lori. We'll see if there are any questions from around the table or on some of our folks who are online. Thank you very much, Lori. So that concludes our public comment. We've had all our reports. It takes us to our council 
discussion and action. Um, quite a list there. And um, I guess I'll just, before we start going down the list, just sort of see if folks have some preliminary thoughts or suggestions on how we can best proceed. Karen Braby. I um, actually, I look forward to council discussion and I, I um, really think we've heard a lot of important information today. So it is challenging to kind of pull it all together and, and really appreciate having this quick list here. Um, I, I do have some questions about um, the, the information that is currently in front of BOEM in particular for the offshore wind planning processes that are, are uh, in progress relative to some of the activities that I understand are happening um, with our federal partners at NIMS. And so maybe I can start with a couple of questions to NIMS about what those activities are and those timelines, if that would be a good place to start. Um, if that pleases We can, chair. sure. Okay. So thank you. Um, and so I would, I would start um, by asking uh, you, Ryan, if you could provide updates on a couple of the projects that I believe are, are ongoing. Um, we've heard in the council process from the uh, California Current Ecosystem team about some uh, analyses that I believe Kelly Andrews is lead on um, that are ongoing and trying to describe fisheries, also projects that are um, ongoing with Blake Feist, and then um, uh, a third set of projects or third project uh, known as PACFEM, uh, the Pacific Fishery Effort Modeling Project led by Lisa Pfeiffer. Just wondering um, what the status is for those products or what those projects are going to lead to and kind of the timeline, how it's stacking up relative to some of the deadlines we've been talking about today. Yeah, um, to the chair, thank you, Dr. Braby, for the question. Um, I can't remember if we noted this under the ground fish dims report when we talked about some of the other uh, survey impacts there, but we are working on a letter for OBOM. Um, with their June 28th, uh, the Oregon call area deadline. So some of this will be in there, but I can at least give some, a general update on those, um, those three lines of work that you just laid out. <clears throat> I'll do it in the order that I think I heard you say. For Dr. Andrews um, in the California ecosystem, um, we are trying to meet the BOEM upcoming deadline. We are working um, through that work to develop maps of commercial fishing efforts that will go into our combinant letter. Uh, these would cover three groundfish fisheries as well as the commercial albacore fishery um, using federal logbook data and three different metrics so that will provide information on the spatial and temporal variation of the ocean use patterns. Um, we did present some of this to the council in the California Current Ecosystem Status Report when we, when we discussed that at, at our past meeting. Um, uh, and, and this will be a little bit more fleshed out, but uh, we haven't had the time to discuss these with uh, the state of Oregon and with the council before, or we won't have the time to do that before the common deadline at the end of this month which would be our preference. So at least uh, when it comes to those um, issues, the council may want to, to, to consider asking BOEM for more time after their comment deadline uh, for discussions along those lines to take place prior to WEA citing um, regarding Dr. Feist's work on fishery footprint values, uh, I think everyone is well aware we, we just heard in public comments, substantial revenue is generated from commercial fisheries operating off the Oregon coast, um, creating heat maps of gross revenue analogous to fishing effort maps. It creates kind of a different but also important perspective of activity. So because of that, uh, the Northwest Center and Dr. Feist's working on generating cumulative inflammation, inflation adjusted gross revenue heat maps that cover over the last decade or 2011 to 2020. Uh, but the state of these analyses will also be 
uh, too preliminary to be included in our letter. Um, so not quite ready at this time, but uh, once they are done, uh, products from these will include peer review papers and scientific literature, presentations at workshops, um, scientific uh, meetings, et cetera. And the timeline for that is probably fourth quarter 2022, so a few months away. Uh, and of course, that also needs to be, um, before we do any of that, we have to have discussions with, with the office and with the state of Oregon. And then I think the last one you mentioned was Dr. Pfeiffer's the PACFEM study. Um, the PACFEM is Pacific Fishing Effort Mapping Project um, but by the Northwest Center again, but also with the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission uh, with BOEM and the states in the region. The goal of that project is to develop spatial data to support ecosystem management initiatives uh, in marine planning along the West Coast, again, designed to inform socioeconomic impact discussions, which can then, of course, be used in all these siting discussions and any decisions about WEAs or cable routes or landing sites. Uh, in particular, the, I think you asked about the products, so those would be a database that would comprehensively join confidential fishery data from multiple sources, such as observer data, fish tickets, um, electronic trip reports, log group data, et cetera. Uh, as well as a publicly accessible fishing effort mapping tool, uh, which utilizes the underlying confidential database that incorporates information from each data source that we have that's available. Um, so that's the general status. Uh, again, um, there's certain aspects of that that have been ready and been presented and certain aspects of that that we will be pointing to and presenting in our letter, but uh, not all of that work is complete at this time. And I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Uh, th thank you through the chair. Um, yes, yeah, so some of, some of that, at least the first two um, would be late, ready later this year, presumably, and uh, the PACFEM study might be a little bit um, further out than that is my understanding from that. Um, if I may ask additional questions um, about that and kind of the value of that body of work, which, which I am looking forward to to reviewing and, and using myself, it, I ask, you know, in terms of NIMS responsibilities and authorities, is it your opinion, do you recommend to the council or guide the council that these would be valuable in the discussions that we're having about winnowing down, for example, from call areas down to WIAs, that kind of winnowing process? Yep, to the chair. Yes, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's very kind of a core aspect of these discussions and, and of course, NIMS authorities, right, understanding and quantifying the potential economic impacts of offshore wind development is, is critical to conflict mapping. It's essential to understanding consequences, both for the commercial and the recreational fishing industry and the associated communities. And, and these analyses and the spatial data that and the projects that I just discussed are, are directly relevant to that. I, th I think I have one, or maybe two more. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, I think not only um, do I see those studies and the products from them as being informative to the Oregon call areas, but, but elsewhere, potentially in, in Washington activities, potentially in California activities as well. Um, uh, but across the board, I see that kind of information from these studies being really critical for um, next steps in evaluating these processes, not just the winnowing, but also things like the NEPA process and the EIS process and being core components of those future processes. Any thoughts on that? Yes, to both. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. Um, and then one, one final question I think is, is that um, we've talked a lot today about workload. Uh, there were some references um, to the challenges that NIMS has relative to workload. And I just wanted to ask specifically, is, uh, would the council advocating for and acquiring support for additional staffing resources to help in these studies help NIMS? Is that, is that something that, you would look to the council for, um, uh, would you, you know, would that be a, a role that we could play? 
Well, it's a challenging question the way it's worded. Let me put it this way. Um, NIMS would not be soliciting any um, direct request for resources from the council on this effort uh, on those efforts. However, I think I am um, very comfortable in stating that the president's budget, which is out right now uh, for FY23, obviously not approved, it's the president's budget, but it directly raises the issue of additional resources, in particular also to the West Coast, and not just the region, but the science centers. So I do feel pretty comfortable in saying that this administration is out there in that budget saying that additional resources would be appreciated. Maybe I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and thank you for working with my challenging wording. Um, it's it's a, um, but I think the resource issue, it's not just the, um, the analyses that need to be completed, but but the, the potential of, of uh, additional resources helping in that effort. I will, I will conclude there with my questions for NIMS and just maybe comment that I think um, NIMS's expertise and, and role and responsibilities uh, and alignment with the council's responsibilities are really kind of a key issue for me and in, in wanting to make sure that, that we are moving forward with the best information possible uh, in this, in all of these uh, marine planning um, activities where we have the information to actually meaningfully minimize impacts to fisheries and the ecosystem resources that we're here to talk about and, and help protect. So that, that was the line of questioning. I really appreciate that input and um, I think you've given us a lot to think about. Thanks, Rain. <laughs> All right, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, the thing that is in the forefront of my mind as we begin our council discussion on this item is what is the council's role uh, in in the development of wind energy, offshore wind energy uh, projects. Um, a lot has changed um, in, in the two years since we formulated the MPC. Um, I don't know that I anticipated the speed at which uh, the federal government would be pursuing placement of wind farms in areas that adversely impact our fishing industry. And I don't know that I anticipated the level of support that there seems to be in some segments of state governments on the West Coast. Um, I. <clears throat> I, I have to say I've been impressed as a gross understatement in terms of how the indus fishing industry and fishing community has responded in terms of trying to influence decision making process and their efforts to protect their livelihoods in the future of the fishing industry. Um, we're a, a quasi-governmental entity here at the council. Um, we have 14 voting members. Um, I'm stating the obvious. Um, four of which are representing states. Um, one representing tribal governments, one representing federal government, and seven that are appointed members from the public. So we have different roles. We have different, um, we are influenced um, in different ways in terms of what we bring to the table and 
what positions we can advocate for and how strongly. Um, I hear the fishing industry loud and clear um, asking, pleading for us to, to stay engaged in a meaningful way and try to influence the direction that wind energy development is proceeding off our west coast. And um, there are things that I can do and say as an individual that I suspect the council cannot. And I su suspect there are things I can do and say that some of our state representatives cannot. Um, you know, when I look at what our fundamental charge is, I put it into primary categories. One is promoting, maintaining, protecting healthy fisheries resources in our federal waters, particularly those that are under the purview of our FMPs, but more broadly. And it is to manage those resources in a manner that achieves optimum yield for the greatest overall benefit to the citizens of the nation, which in my mind is completely consistent with having and maintaining a healthy and economically viable fishing industry. So those are my kind of two primary measuring sticks in terms of what I think our responsibilities are and, and what um, we should be focused on. Uh, but given the, the makeup of our group and what, what we can and, and can't do, maybe, um, I don't know if I want to say that it takes us to the lowest common denominator of what we can do that meets um, whatever limitations that any one of us might have. Um, but it, it, it does, in my mind, limit us in, in some ways to what we can do that we might otherwise do if we didn't have those restrictions placed on us. Um, so the, 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 an important part of the conversation, to me at least, maybe I'm the only one today, is to have a bit of a dialogue about what, <clears throat> what is our role and where we, how can we be the most effective in influencing the decision makers in a manner that's consistent with those two goalposts. And um, when we, before, you know, as we dive down into the, I'll call it minutia of what's going on, um, if there's any way we can at least get to some common ground on what, where we, you know, how we, th where we think we can be the most effective in influencing a positive outcome to this relative to our primary responsibilities, I would like to spend a little bit of time having that discussion. Um, I think the line of questioning Karin just had with Ryan in terms of what information, uh, uh, NOAA Fisheries can bring to bear is, is is an important one. Um, I'm aware that, you know, the states have a wealth of information as well. Um, we, um, we have the ability to, to, to respond and write letters uh, as we have done, and I'm not suggesting that we stop that. Um, uh, but is, is there something in addition to that going beyond that that we can be more effective in terms of influencing the decision makers. So those are just some, some of what's in my head here as we're taking on this topic and figuring out where we're, where we're going from today. Thank you, Phil. I think you raised some important threshold issues about how we go forward here. 
So you have some further discussion. We will take a break uh, at some point, because I know some folks may want to fine tune some language on a motion perhaps, but let's continue the discussion. <laughs> or not. Uh, Karen Braby, and then uh, Karen Braby, and then Corey. Oh. Yeah, I, I appreciate how you frame that, Phil, and I, I, um, I agree that that needs to drive our discussion and our actions from here on is what our primary role is, and and how what what the most appropriate actions are for the council and the way that I would um, characterize our actions so far with creating the MPC, engaging directly with BOEM and coordinating before council meetings, having presentations from them as having a dialogue with them has been to make sure that the council family is aware of all of the activities and there are many. Um, so it's kind of an awareness component and, and documenting that in the council record. Um, creating those reports and, and uh, letters that have gone out stating the council's interests and concerns um, that you that you shared and that has been valuable not only for the external audience, but for ourselves to focus in on, on what those core issues and roles are. Um, and um, I guess finding our, our voice on this, this topic. Um, and I, I've heard today that we want to keep doing that. There is um, encouragement from our stakeholders. There um, seems to be agreement so far, at least not disagreement um, in continuing that role um, from council members. So I see that moving forward. And then the question is what what else is there that might fit in with that role? Um, and that's a that's a, a tough question. And I, I go back to uh, Mr. Smith's comments earlier about not wanting to prioritize one fishery over another, uh, for example. Um, how is it that the council can engage and be provide meaningful in, information, meaningful uh, input into this process and stay um, true to that, that um, desire? And I, I think that doing what we're doing is essential and I wanna see that continue, um, but uh, it is, it's a challenge to, to think about what else we could do and, and how that fits with our roles and responsibilities. Um, so I don't have a, I don't have a silver bullet on that um, question. I just am supporting your reflection on that and, and the importance of us thinking about it. Uh, Corey Niles followed by John Uritz. Thank, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll, I'll try to be concise here. And on Phil's question, I guess from our department's point of view, we're, we, we don't we see um, our role given to us by by state statute and, and by involvement in the council as is um, very consistent with with what the council has been doing. Um, I won't go too long into it. But you know, in, in Washington, we have a little, we have a marine spatial plan, which was developed, you know, going through basically a scenario of exactly what we're seeing happen in California and in, in Oregon. Um, so we've seen it played out. We did the maps, we mapped places um, were suitable for wind energy. And so, you know, we, we thought we came up with this process, um, you know, thinking through those scenarios. Um, yeah, I guess I guess uh, I don't have a silver bullet at this point too, but I but I BOEM is um, it's a federal decision making process very much like we speak to here. The council doesn't have direct authority, but you know, and I'm no expert, but you know, BOEM is subject 
to the same Administrative Procedure Act laws, NEPA laws that 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 our decisions are reviewed to. They they have to show rational connections between their their legal mandates and 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 the decisions they're making. They have to produce adequate NEPA analyses. And so you know the the strength of council process is you know one it's it's as as Mike Conroy through. Uh, the MPC and others have pointed out many times is it's a bottom up process with you know stakeholder engagement, but there's also um, the best available science, national standard two side of things, and we are we strive to be science based, a rational decision making body, and um, that is consistent with our agency's mission of how we will approach um, projects proposed in federal waters off our state. You heard Mike speak to how the consistency process worked in California in terms of conditional approval and requiring impacts from analyses of the type folks are asking for. So I said I was going to be concise, but I guess I'm not. But the uh, yeah, so I, I'm and Phil's, Phil's question, I'm um, we see the council's role is, is, is continuing to engage. I'm curious. I'm looking at groups like the ecosystem work group, the ground fish um, Endangered Species Work Group, where we get folks from additional experts from from NIMPS from the states, we bring them together to help the council understand the um, you know the best available science um, in in the policy issues and really work through them in an open, transparent um, way. You know, Ryan and in response to Karin spoke to the activities that the Science Center folks are working on now. So I don't have a, a suggestion for today, but I'm wondering how how we can that model might be um one model we could look at in terms of um influencing the decision making process uh with boom and yeah apologies somewhat rambling there but uh i will i'll stop and I look forward to contributing to the to the rest of the discussion thank you corey uh john ugaritz yeah thanks mr chair um looking at the Council action on the screen in front of us, hearing what we've heard, uh, knowing what we've done so far. Um, I think it's it's pretty clear that you know the council needs to continue engaging in these processes, that items you know, one, three, four, and five require some direct council input uh, letters. Um, I think uh, Obviously, people are struggling. I think the council, our membership, myself, would prefer to have a more lead role in some of these decisions, which we simply don't have. And so we are stuck in the same uh, loop as many of the stakeholders that we represent in terms of commenting to another agency. Um, and so that's frustrating. I, I understand that. Um, Mr. Dooley asked a good question. What are what are the other councils doing? And you know, a quick search of offshore wind in the Northeast region leads you to a website that the New England Council and Mid-Atlantic Council share. If you look at the actions they've taken, essentially they're doing what we're doing. There's a long list of letters to BOEM from the two councils uh, and then information uh, to their constituents on the potential proposals out there. It's very similar to the website that the Pacific Council already has. Maybe they've got a little bit more background information on some other activities that we could think about providing to our constituents in a summarized way. Um, so really where I see the, the need for discussion at this point today is we've got some draft policy guidance and we've got an existing Marine Planning Committee uh, where there apparently is some commentary and advice needed on what the next steps are for that committee. Um, and, and from my perspective, for the policy guidance, we've got some excellent comments from the Marine Planning Committee, the Habitat Committee, and others that could be incorporated into that guidance. And with regard to future Marine Planning Committee activities, I think we need some more discussion because from my perspective, the planning committee has not been as effective as it could be in some arenas because they have not been engaged in those arenas uh, in the right way. And I think we might want to clarify that so everybody's on the same page with regard to how the Marine Planning Committee is used in, in our benefit.
Thank you, John. Phil, or Joe, sorry, Joe. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So listening to the discussion, you know, I appreciate, you know, the perspective that Phil laid out there, um, acknowledging, you know, those of us around the table here, you know, what we represent um, and what our obligations are. So kind of reflecting on that, as well as the uh, tribal uh, report that I provide on behalf of the McCall and uh, Quinault uh, Indian Nation. You know, I, I certainly understand, you know, like my position here is to, you know, uphold, you know, the provisions and requirements of the MSA as well as, as, well as other applicable law and other applicable law here in this context, you know, includes uh, treaty rights. And what we've heard from the uh, tribes in, in their testimony they had me provide is that, you know, the current process isn't working. Um, it isn't designed, nor is it um, accomplishing um, an outcome where, you know, they are protecting um, treaty fishing rights. Um, and that um, may very well impact, you know, the ocean environment areas where they fish, as well as impacts to the migratory stocks of treaty fish. And so when I think about, um, you know, how we might try and deal with that one, um, you know, maybe there's some, you know, additional uh, thought or engagement with the tribe as to how we might go about that. Um, you know, I recognize, you know, BOEM, um, you know, they are a, a federal agency. Um, I don't know quite exactly, you know, uh, what, um, you know, obligation that they have to tribes here along the West Coast that have federally recognized fishing rights. Um, but given, you know, their activity does uh, affect and impact tribes and tribal resources, um, that should be appropriately uh, considered. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for the perspective. Well, we can have some further discussion or we can work down the list or we can take a break. Karen Braby. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I'm um, teeing off of something that John um, said as he was going, ticking through the, the council actions that are in front of us today. Um, some of them are easier to provide guidance on and others are not um, as easy. And it seems to me that number six is the place where we um, have the opportunity to talk about uh, committee function and how this is working and how to optimize it and that we might start there. And I, I do have... Um, I have some writing, which is in the form of a motion. It is lengthy. Um, and if the council so chooses, I could offer that motion and we could take a break and it could be considered during the break with some quiet time and maybe some paper copies. And we could resume with council discussion if that would be uh, desirable. Well, I think that uh, we're probably ready to start making some concrete progress with our tasks here. And I think offering a motion is a good way. And then uh, if folks want to take a break to contemplate that and other steps we need to take today, let's, that's fine. Um, I will send it to Sandra right now. I think she has one version, but there is a newer one. Um, so let me do that, that so that she can get it projected for us.
I noticed that John Ugaritz has his hand up. So um, why don't we go to John while that motion is coming through, John? Thanks, Mr. Chair. I was just going to say if if uh, Corin's suggestion to post the motion and then share it in hard copy so people can mull it over in a break, if if that could be sent out uh, by council staff to the people online, that'd be helpful. And let me just check with Sandra to confirm that can be sent out by email so people have it in front of them. It being lengthy, and I'm getting a an affirmative on that. So yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we, I think we, we can do that. We just need to know who all to send it to. Should we use the list on the Ring Central, um, you know, webinar or, yeah, not. So the council members that are logged in here, we can do that. I guess until we see the motion and how long it is. <laughs> Maybe but. it's so long, it's taking a long time to get across the council chamber. <laughs> there she has it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sandra. And thanks for everyone's patience um, in uh, getting the right version. I'll read through it. I move that the council number one, reaffirm intent and scope of the MPC committee at this one year anniversary of this ad hoc committee. Elevate fishing community voices and emerging marine planning issues, especially for public processes. Um, B, play a key role in the council process to identify priority issues for council engagement and marine planning with emphasis on offshore wind and aquaculture opportunity areas. The emphasis on offshore wind and aquaculture opportunity areas is reaffirmed. C, collaborate with the Habitat Committee to address habitat and EFH issues. D, coordinate with advisory subpanels to facilitate input on marine planning to the council for consideration in council letters. E, initiate council response during public comment opportunities on behalf of the council, recognizing that external deadlines do not mesh well with council meeting schedule. Two, guide the MPC committee for the upcoming year on the following topics. A, meetings. Schedule one recorded public webinar weeks prior to each council meeting. Two, one, identify high priority comment opportunities for QR letter response. Two, discuss substance of QR letter comments for fisheries concerns and issues uh, particularly. Three, catalog past and future marine planning activities, including meetings, letters of interest, et cetera. Four, plan for report development uh, to the council covering the above topics and other committee logistics. B, QR letter responses are the default approach for the MPC decoupled from council floor time. And one, are high priority when an issue has high potential to impact the council's resources, fisheries, communities, EFH habitat, research surveys, et cetera. And the council voice in the process is deemed necessary. This is in contrast to issues for which there is value as public information for the council family who can choose to individually participate as desired. Two, should be collaboratively crafted, but with a clear lead in sections relying on expertise of the MPC for fisheries and fishery impact concerns and relying on expertise of the Habitat Committee for habitat related and EFH issues as is traditional practice. Three, after MPC and HC complete 
a draft letter uh, should be finalized with an additional coordination opportunity with advisory subpanels, uh, which should occur via MPC members listed as HMSAS, CPSAS, GAP, SAS, and EAS to the degree possible relative to external deadlines with council staff finalizing the draft for council QR approval process. C, reiterate consistent policy statements in QR letters. One, council strongly advocates to outside partners that marine planning processes should rely on best information available to represent fisheries, habitats, and ecosystem. Acquisition of best information may require some time to synthesize, analyze, and vet available data sets for purposes of that specific planning process. And note in one that the council prioritizes quality and completeness of information over expediency. Thank you, uh, Karin, for the motion. Um, is that language complete and accurate? It is, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, before um, asking for a second, if we had a parliamentarian, I, would, I could ask if this is proper, but we don't have one. So we'll take a break and that'll give um, folks an opportunity to contemplate this and it may simplify matters um, before we have to deal with an amendment process. So uh, we'll take a, how long a break do folks want? 10 minutes, 15 minutes? 10? Okay, 10 minute break. We'll give it 12 minute break. We'll come back at 4.20.
All right, if everyone could uh, take their seats. All right, um, there is a motion on the floor. It has not been seconded. I'm going to turn to the maker of the motion and see if she would like to revise her motion before I look for a second. No, thank you. It, it stands as offered. All right, now I'll look for a second. Seconded by Krista Svensson. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I um, appreciate the, the council discussion on uh, the council's authorities under the MSA uh, to main, maintain healthy fish stocks and it's, uh, and maintain sustainable harvest levels. And it's with this context in mind um, that um, an efficient MPC process uh, is uh, in the council's best interest and will help us further those goals. And it's with those uh, things in mind that we've had this discussion today and, and with that in mind that I've made this motion. So the first um, section really is uh, hearkening back to the original um, state reports and council discussion that followed um, on elevating fishing community voices uh, at the table of marine planning processes, um, recognizing that some of those processes uh, do not have seats for um, stakeholders, but do for governments. And so that was really a driving force of how we developed the MPC, including the composition um, and the purpose. Uh, and so I wanted to reiterate that role um, because it is unique um, among our council advisory subpanels and, and teams, and I think it's worth refreshing at this one year anniversary. Uh, we also anticipated that there would be um, too many issues to uh, address uh, for the council, that there would be too many opportunities to engage and that we needed somebody to track all of these activities that were happening. That's B, that's the key role for the, the MPC committee. Um, and that the MPC uh, committee in under C was not uh, designed to really be expert in habitat issues. And so that there was a key role for the habitat committee to play in helping with letters um, in these public processes to really get into the specifics on habitat and EFH issues. Um, we've struggled as a council to find um, really efficient ways to, to have advisory some sub panels fully engaged in this process, but we've been trying different things and, and, and trying to improve that coordination. It's working, it's not perfect, but that's something we uh, want to continue is making sure that the council family has a voice. And uh, E recognizes, again, this, this issue that external deadlines don't match the council calendar, and we need to find a way of engaging in these public comment opportunities on their timelines, not try and force others to comply with our timeline. So in reaffirming these kind of starting principles um, of the MPC, uh, and looking at the next year, I've offered some uh, specific um, comments on, um, and I'm looking at the wrong version of my motion, but I'll fix that, um, uh, specific comments that reflect the conversation we've had today. Uh, A is specific to meeting frequency and structure. Uh, I have suggested here that we schedule uh, one recorded public webinar weeks prior to each council meeting. And those words were selected very specifically and intentionally. The recorded um, aspect of this reflects the um, sometimes difficulty and rapid timelines 
of MPC members, Habitat committee members staying fully in the loop on what is happening and how letters are, are being developed and, and what the discussions in the MPC are. And if schedules conflict, which they often have where an MPC webinar is scheduled over another advisory body meeting, then those individuals are not able to fully um, listen to the discussion. Recording the webinars is a simple way to make sure that those who are interested have access to that discussion. The weeks prior uh, to the council meeting is um, vague on purpose because as we all know, some of our council meetings are preceded by months of time without scheduled council meetings and in other cases are preceded by three or four weeks uh, between council meetings. And so I didn't want to specify uh, weeks, but this is really about providing sufficient time for the MPC and the Habitat Committee to thoughtfully proceed with their work, the issues, if they are working on a QR letter, having the time to really think about it, move through the writing process, the sharing and collaboration process and circulate with advisory subpanel um, members um, as they can working within those external deadlines. I think the components within the meetings are uh, straightforward. So I will move um, to the QR letter responses. Uh, and this again, the, the language here is chosen very intentionally that um, we have heard about process problems, trying to fit the QR letter or a council letter response um, into the council process when it's responding to an external deadline. And so here in this motion, I am suggesting that the preferred way of the MPC generating letters for council to send out on these public comment opportunities is by QR letter response. That is different from any other committee and process in the council process. I acknowledge that. Uh, I think that the QR letter response process is not ideal, but we are dealing with external deadlines and we need to meet those. And that's a higher priority for me that the council has a good opportunity to voice our opinion and our concerns and our priorities in those external processes than fitting uh, the letter response into the council calendar. I just realized that I'm providing rationale. I'm not sure I have a second. Thank you. I'm just two in my head. Apologies. Okay. Thank you, Krista. Um, and so the, um, the priority for me is to meet those external deadlines with an anticipated and steady process rather than trying to fit it into the council process. And so if we can establish what that QR letter response looks like and streamline that for the MPC, regardless of whether it's in conjunction with a council meeting, that process will continue. It will run parallel with the council process if it's concurrent, or it will be between council meetings if it's not concurrent. And, and that's the design, intentional design. Um, I think the, the next sticky part uh, is BI, uh, and here I have said that the council voice in the process is deemed necessary, and I think today we've heard a lot about um, workload, are there, are there opportunities that we wouldn't want to comment on, um, we've heard that the, the lead role should be more clearly specified for um, times when there is a QR letter um, called for. I have not included in this a vision for who would make that decision, but I propose here just verbally, and I would be happy to um, write that down or have 
council discussion on this point, that council leadership, including the executive director, the chair, the vice chair, the co-chairs of the MPC committee, the marine planning lead for council members, which up until this point recently has been myself, um, are part of the decision-making process. Is this particular public comment opportunity a time when the council chooses to initiate a letter? Yes or no. Um, I think there are some concerns about um, those opportunities being place-based in a particular state. And so I would add to that list of individuals a state rep from the state in which that issue is taking place to kind of bring that whole group together to make that call. And this would serve as a, a small executive committee, if you will, to, to make, help make that decision. And that could be formalized. I think that I'll skip down to C, which is reiterating consistent policy statements and QR letters. Um, this is really speaking to the need for the best scientific information um, before moving forward in, in marine planning issues that impact council resources. Um, and that there are a lot of data out there. They may not be in the appropriate format or synthesized or analyzed appropriately for a particular process. And the council should be reiterating that statement and the, the strongly encourage that the data for that are available for these public processes uh, go through a comprehensive synthesis analysis and vetting to feed into the public processes and the time that is needed to do that should be taken and that that principle should be part of our ongoing um, communication out on marine planning topics. And ultimately, really, that leads to a prioritization of quality and completeness of information that's being used by decision makers over expediency of those processes. I think there are a lot of elements in this motion that uh, need additional council discussion. I offer it as a way of focusing our discussion today rather than um, trying to truncate or um, prevent discussion. Uh, and I, I see that this is going to be an ongoing um, an ongoing discussion with the council. This is today is not going to be the end of this, but I think that we can really make some headway today and kind of clarifying the role and trying to really streamline the work that we're asking of the MPC and of the council. Um, in responding to the variety of, of issues that are facing us. So I thank you for indulging me and listening to my rationale and look forward to discussion on it. Thank you. <clears throat> Karin, are there questions for the maker of the motion? John Ugaritz. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Karin, for the motion. I know this is a complex one and and you did a great job trying to get everything down. I think my question is involving that section B and B1. Um, what you said, I think is more consistent with my thoughts on this. Um, when you were talking about B, you said quick letter responses are the default approach when, when a letter is necessary. Um, or something to that effect. And I think that's an important part. I don't think the default approach of the MPC is simply to write quick letter responses for everything. And I think that's something we've been struggling with here. And so I guess my question is, would you, you mentioned this sort of small steering committee. Uh, would you agree that when an item comes up in between council meetings where the council can't direct the MPC to craft a letter, um, that it would be the MPC in coordination with the executive director, council chair, 
and perhaps a representative of of the state impacted to determine if the thing that's come up is a high enough priority for a letter response being needed. Yeah, thank you for the clarifying question, John. And and yes, it, the the in to uh, be the default approach could be reworded default process. Um, it's not the default decision that a QR letter response is initiated for every issue. And then B1 gets at how you prioritize among public comment opportunities. And there it is, the small group. Um, I think you listed everyone that was in my mind. Again, just to repeat, it's the MPC co-chairs, the chair of the council, the vice chair of the council, the executive director, uh, the uh, fish and wildlife rep from the state in which the issue is happening and the marine planning um, lead for the council members. John, did that answer your question or address your issue? It, it did. Um, I, I think I would probably want to voice an amendment to the motion to capture that because I don't think it's adequately covered here. And I do have an amendment if it's time for that. Yeah, why don't we uh, address that right now? Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to have to be kind of jumping back and forth on screens here, but uh, it's within B. And I would add the text after MPC. When a letter has been deemed necessary, by the MPC in coordination with the executive director, comma, council chair, comma, and state wildlife agency representative for the state involved. So John, is that language uh, accurate? It is, thank you. Did, did you want to include vice chairs? I. If if I can speak to it, um, I, I I left this somewhat more limited than the list that Karen mentioned. My assumption would be that if the vice chair is not if the chair is not available, that the vice chair would would take on that responsibility. Uh, similarly, I put the MPC collectively in there. My assumption would be that if the full MPC can't be brought together to discuss it by email or some other method that the chair and or vice chair of the MPC would make the decision. So I'm leaving a little flexibility in here in language, um, but making it clear that it's not just the MPC or just the executive director or one, one of these groups making the decision that a letter is necessary. All right, thank you. Is there a second on the amendment? Seconded by Corey Niles. Uh, please uh, speak uh, to the amendment if further, if you deem necessary. I'm on mute. I think I've described what I intended. All right. Any uh, questions for the maker of the motion to amend or any discussion? 
Karen Bravey. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, John, for the amendment. Uh, I'm I'm happy to to vote for this amendment. I do uh, want to have some discussion about the role of the Marine Planning um, Council member, but I'm prepared to vote for this amendment and then have that discussion. All right, great. Any uh, other discussion on the amendment? Uh, not seeing any other hands, I'll call the question on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion to amend passes uh, unanimously. We're back to the motion, main motion as amended, and we'll continue. Karen Braby. Um, thank you. I um, I think that um, John called for a discussion on this topic, and and I would like to offer uh, initiation of some discussion on the role that I've been playing for the council as the marine planning council member. Uh, and um, in that discussion, if there is a need to further amend the motion, we can do that. Um, but the over time, the the role of the um, somewhat informal marine planning council member has changed. Uh, it started in uh, response to the federal uh, regional planning body process uh, where the council recognized that that we wanted to have a voice in that process and worked to, to have a seat there. And when the regional planning body was, um, was uh, taken away uh, through subsequent administ administration decisions, uh, the West Coast Ocean Alliance resumed in that role, different um, capacity, different authorities, but resumed in that role. And I've maintained uh, participation in that body as, as a representative of the PFMC. And the second role that I've played as a marine planning um, council member representing this council has been in coordination uh, with uh, BOEM on offshore wind specifically, and we've reported to the council a number of times about pre-council calls, coordinating with them about their presentations to the council and conveying kind of needs and desires of engagement with BOEM um, as they were planning to come and engage with the council. So those two roles still um, are valuable in my mind. I recommend that we continue to have somebody in that role that a council member um, separate from the leadership team is available to participate in those activities and represent the needs of the council. Um, the regional um, West Coast Ocean Alliance in particular is comprised of a very different composition from the council process and fisheries um, uh, are, are not uh, across the board expertise of that group. And so it's a, it's a valuable perspective. With that, um, I have served in that role for a number of years. Um, I am happy continuing in that role. I am also happy considering somebody else for that role. I am not, um, uh, I would welcome that discussion and consideration by the council. And I, what I want is for the council to have someone that is um, prepared to participate and reflects the council and, and is ready to take on that role um, and that they're effective in that role. And if that's me, great. If it's somebody else, that's great. And if somebody else wants a turn, that's great. So I'm really open. I just um, want to have clarity on, on my opinion that that role has been important and valuable. Thank you, Karin. Uh, John Ugritz. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Karen. Um, I agree that that role is not just important, but probably critical. And I think uh, you've done an admirable job over the last several years filling that role. I think the council should definitely have a council member who is representing the Pacific Fishery Management Council at the West Coast Ocean Partners discussions. Um, and that that should definitely continue. I don't think I agree that that individual should necessarily be the go-to for all things marine planning that the council does. Um, and so I think, for example, 
if there is a discussion with Bohm about a particular call area or proposal that that individual could be involved, but that the other states, depending on their uh, interest in that process, must also be involved in the discussion. Um, and so, you know, planning for those types of meetings with Bohm in particular needs to include not just the single individual designated to represent us on the West Coast uh, partnership, but but also, um, you know, the, the other people that may not be that same individual. And similarly, you'll note, for example, that in, in my amendment to this motion, I don't know that that individual is necessarily the right person to decide whether a letter should be written in all cases. Um, and so I think we need to clarify that. I think there's places where the MPC is the right place to discuss things. And then when the council is being represented formally in an outside venue, that we need to have a person designated. Thank you, John. Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I'm not sure I followed uh, the entirety of that, uh, John. Um, I will just say, I first of all, I think Karin's done a, as you said, admirable job of taking that role on. Um, I think she's extremely knowledgeable about issues and process. And um, I have complete confidence in her continuing to do that. On near what I th think I understood your second point was that if there is a venue in which that individual was going to represent the interest of the council and the issue involved um, a particular, well, it always, I suppose it always will, but, or generally will involve a particular state, let's say it involved California, uh, we would ex we would expect our spokesperson, our representative to uh, contact um, the, the state uh, official for their designee um, letting them know of the venue and the issue and inviting them to accompany them to that venue to express uh, the, the um, position, if, if that's what it is, of the council or the perspective of the council. Um, I think that would be what I would um, that I would expect of that person. Um, I don't know that, I don't think this ne necessarily needs to be captured in the motion, but that's what I, that's kind of what my perspective is, what my view is, what my expectation would be of that individual. John. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Phil. I, I think I agree with you 100% that uh, I'm not saying have a different individual represent the council in these formal venues. So, you know, currently we've got the West Coast Alliance. We should have a single person designated, and definitely, as you describe, that individual should be reaching out to the other states as needed. Um, the only thing that I'm saying. Uh, in addition to that, it's not different from that, is that if council staff is organizing some kind of briefing call with BOEM or another agency on a specific topic outside of these formal venues, um, then I would 
have the individual state affected be involved in that call as opposed to just the designee to the West Coast Alliance after coordination with the state. Phil? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, John. I think that would be perfectly reasonable to do and frankly would be a significant omission if they didn't involve uh, the affected state. Um, but I would also just emphasize that I would want our designated spokesperson to be a part of that conversation regardless so that that person can um, stay informed about um, the activities, the issues, and what uh, we might expect of that individual in a different forum. So I, m that's a long-winded way of saying I agree with, with what the expectation would be in terms of involving the state a representative in that conversation between the executive team of our of the council. Karen Braby. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, if I'm tracking the conversation right, I think that that means that the amendment to the motion needs to be expanded by one um, position, which is that the marine planning uh, representative as appointed by the council is also part of this group. Well, you know, I just, just to interject, um, back under a prior administration, we, um, we had an, a formal appointment to a body that doesn't exist anymore, right? Uh, did we, I don't see in our representation, in our roster, representations to other forums that um, there's a there's an appointment to the West Coast Partnership. Maybe that's an oversight, but um, but you have been serving in that role, so um, I don't know if we need to <laughs> need to formalize that or not. I don't I don't think so. I think it's been fine the way it's been going. I think that John makes a point about having. If a California or a Washington issue pops up, make sure they're they're involved. Um, Karin? Yeah, and I, I don't have any any disagreement with that at all. Um, and I think the amendment reflects that by saying a state wildlife agency representative is there. But to Phil's point, it does not say that the person, if the council chooses to continue having a marine planning council member designee, formal or not. Um, that that should be part of this motion. Do, we, do you wish to offer an amendment? I do. <laughs> uh, Phil Anderson. You can't amend your own motion. Okay. I welcome a friendly amendment. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you for stepping in as parliamentarian. Well, I hate to admit this, but I have Robert's Rules of Order up on my screen here. Um, I, could I just ask a question before I step yes, you my foot in my mouth? So under under B is what we're talking about here. And we're, so this isn't, with respect to when we have a quick response letter, it's the default approach. And when a letter has been deemed necessary, we want to add to this list of individuals, the marine planning, what, I mean, what is the title? What would be the appropriate title or the addition there that would pick up on this appropriately? May I ask that question of Karin, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Thank you. And and thank you for that recognition. I would I would ask that um, Carrie go back and look at what that title is that is in the record somewhere. Um, 
Michelle Culver, I think Marcy Uremko and I have all held that position, if you will, uh, that designation by the council. And so I, I don't recall what the title is. I believe I, I have that here. Um, well, at least the, the formal appointment uh, in terms of represent, representatives to other forums uh, was, was a designation to the West Coast Regional Planning Body. I'm not sure if there was another um, designation or appointment made. Um, but I think for purposes of this motion, we can simply put a title in and then deal with that on an ad hoc basis under membership appointments. How's that? Mr. Anderson. You ready for this, Senator? <laughs> I would move an amendment. By adding, this is in B, the amendment pertains to B. You already know that. But. So following council chair, add marine planning council representative. Then it, then it would go comma and state wildlife agency representative for the state involved. So that's where it would be inserted is immediately after the council chair. All right, Mr. Anderson, is that language complete and accurate? I hope so. I hope so too. Is there a second? Seconded by Corey Niles. Please speak to your proposed amendment as necessary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think this makes sure that we have our, our team um, of individuals that we're looking to be responsible for making decisions about marine planning in issues, including quick response letters, that we have them all in the room when we're making these types of decisions. Thank you. Any questions for the maker of the motion to amend or any discussion? John Ugritz. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and, and thanks, Phil, for getting that in there. Um, I had actually intentionally left that position out of my amendment, um, and my, my rationale was that I see there being two separate things going on here. There's the MPC that has a role in helping us generate comments and information about what's going on in marine planning, and then there's the formal council designee to sit on specific bodies and current current place it's the uh offshore whatever it's called <laughs> it lost the lost the link but um the west coast ocean alliance um i don't know that that individual needs to be involved in deciding whether a particular issue merits having a quick response letter um I do feel that representatives should be involved in any discussions with BOEM as Phil and I were just discussing before the amendment came on. Um, but that was a separate topic than, than this one. Um, so I'm, I'm not heartily opposed to this, but just wanted to lay out there my rationale and thinking for, for why it was not included in my amendment. Thank you, John. Bob Dooley. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is just a quick comment here. Um, I, I noticed it says state wildlife agency representative for the state involved. What if there's two or three states involved? And I just want to know to make sure that we're just covering all of that. And maybe it does the way it says it, but just pointing it out. Yeah, so right now the discussion's on the amendment, but I think that's referencing a particular issue in marine planning, for example, an issue in Washington or California, 
or Oregon where the Marine Planning Council representative is not from one of those states. So then it, could, it, could, it couldn't could, uh, be more than one state. Okay, fine, thank you. All right, are there any other discussion on the motion to amend? Not seeing any, I'll, oh, Corey Niles, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll just, I'll just brief. Um, I'm going to speak now and, and apply to the subsequent votes. But yeah, we're we're um, we've somewhat been on the sidelines in, in deference to our, the activities off the other states. We will be more active depending on on what happens off Washington. So I'm envisioning some scenarios about you know a state not wanting a letter to go forward against everyone else and how that resolved. But I'm at this point, let's let's give this a go. It it, it looks like a good approach, and, and um, it, it it is. Uh, we've seen experiences the past year where this this could have helped. So supportive of the concept, um, and I'll stop there. All right, thank you. Is there any further discussion on the motion to amend? I'll call the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions. The motion to amend passes unanimously. We're now back to the main motion is amended. Further discussion? Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate the motion. It is incredibly thorough. And I um, have not spoken much in terms of commentary about this issue, but I think we heard a tremendous amount today about the urgency and the importance from our committees and from the public, particularly industry. I can only imagine um, how much everybody has learned in this process. I continue to learn in the process and I'm not as close as Dr. Braby, who's sitting next to me. Um, and I've thought over time, boy, this is going to impact us economically, and boy, this is going to impact us environmentally, um, and boy, this is going to impact us culturally, uh, similar to when we put dams in on the Columbia, and we you know, still talk about June hogs and Celilo in a lot of places where we don't have the access we did. But, but what I didn't think about prior today and what I am appreciative of the CPSAS in particular bringing up was um, how this is going to impact our fisheries with recruitment. And so much of the work that I did in terms of sales was looking at the recruitment of cold water pink shrimp, which we don't typically talk about here, um, but that is definitely something that I really wasn't thinking, boy, this could impact the spring transition. Um, in terms of, of will those shrimp come back? Uh, will our crab come back? And again, appreciate Mr. Thiebik coming in today and talking to us, even if we are not managing crab fisheries. So I really wanted to lend my support, um, again, on the urgency and the importance of this and in slowing down and getting things right. I also wanted to talk just for a moment on, a, on two of the points. One is the that I'm fully supportive of re reaffirming the intent of this particular committee. I'm appreciative of the work, 15 letters over the last year for rapid responses, amazing. Um, so are the reports that come out of your, your group. Um, and I'm also on the second point, really appreciative of putting in there for recording um, the public webinars. I think that that's important for those of us that miss meetings there's a lot of meetings going on right now in a lot of venues. But I also think it's really important for new participants. People come into our fisheries, people come in to uh, interest about fishing in general um, or the ocean in general. And they, in many cases, would like to go back. Uh, and reading notes is very different than seeing or hearing. Um, what was said in those meetings. So I am just wanting to say thank you for, for including that to allow people who 
didn't have the opportunity because they just didn't happen to be in the room or aware of the, the item, the ability to catch up. And with that, I will close my remarks, but thank you for such a thorough and thoughtful motion. Corey Niles. Thanks, and sorry, I'm gonna go a smaller picture than Krista's, but very supportive of what she said there, but um, I reminded I, I, on Bob Dooley's question, he brought up, you know, only said state wildlife agency representative. Um, but along the spirit of what, what Phil was saying about talking to the right people, we just we would, would point out that if this were Washington and it was a significant um, issue where the that affected the tribal coastal tribes, the UNAs, we would we, that was I don't know if we need to say that formally here. I'm, I don't think so, but we would do that in the in the course of the business and, and reach out. Um, and that this is also in the Olympic Wind project is an example of proposed project is what Bob's talking about. It's in a place that would be very important to, to uh, Oregon's community. So, and then this is layered on top of the, uh, the, the work response approval process itself. So not suggesting an amendment, but just articulating on, uh, that was a good question by Bob. It also, you know, um, brought up the tribes um, to us. You know, we have sovereign governments within our own state. So just wanted to put that how we, how we, we would um, approach this, you know, when it when it uh, when it approach, when it arrives arises excuse me thanks Joe yeah thanks uh, Mr Chair um, maybe as a follow up to Corey's comments. Um, also had, had a little bit of exchange with the Merrick as well uh, just now. Uh, so I didn't uh, initially um, catch um, the potential need to uh, include, uh, say, a travel representative um, for those uh, you know instances where it might involve a travel UNA or uh, some other direct uh, travel uh, impact or concern or issue um, so I, I think my initial um, you know uh, perspective on this at, at this time is that you know we do have a, a travel representative on MPC um, that individual I uh, understand um, does coordinate with other tribes uh, should something come up that might uh, affect them um, and so that that might be uh, you know, the default, I think, for, for the tribes is to try and have that individual um, uh, understand that, uh, you know, as things come up, um, that they should be coordinating with the, the, the tribe at issue. Um, so I, I intend to have some additional follow-ups with the tribe to see, um, you know, whether, you know, that is adequate um, for this purpose and this uh, framework of ports that's being laid out for a quick response letters. Thank you, Joe. Further discussion? Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, thank you for this, Karin. Uh, I plan to vote for this. Um, I'm reading something in here and I just wanted to confirm with you, which is under 1B, it says the emphasis on offshore wind and um, aquaculture opportunity areas is reaffirmed. Um, I, Mike Conroy told us today about some growing interest in other technologies in the ocean. Uh, I think of things like seabed mining or wave energy. And I think offshore wind has been a really um, bold example of how quickly yet how impactful issues can come up. Um, I'm reading this other places in the motion um, that there is the ability of this group um, to bring issues like that to the council's attention, um, even with this with this emphasis on offshore wind and aquaculture. Um, am I reading that correctly? Karin? <laughs> That was my intent. Um, we've heard that there needs to be some way for the MPC and for our advisory subpanels to to figure out what the priorities of the council are 
And the, the reason that this committee was developed in the first place was because of aquaculture opportunity areas and offshore wind processes spinning up and requests from NOAA and BOEM respectively of council's time to um, help engage with them on those issues. This language doesn't preclude other issues from coming in there, but we've heard from the MPC that they don't have a lot of extra capacity lying around. And so I think we as a council need to be clear on what is what is most important, but we, we need to give the MPC the latitude to say, hey, you know, last month it was offshore wind and aquaculture opportunity areas. There's this new issue that's heating up and bring that to our attention. And um, we could, you know, the intent of this motion is that we would have the opportunity to reevaluate. But it is intentional that I wanted to kind of at, beg the question of the council, are these still our highest priorities? Because if there are four issues at hand for the MPC and they can only do two or three, they need the confidence that they are doing the council's will in picking the AOA and offshore wind issue to deal with. Does that answer your question, Corey? It does, thank you. All right, any, any further discussion on this motion? All right, I'm not seeing any hands. That's not to say someone hasn't raised one, I don't see it, but um, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Karin, thank you very much. And Karin, please go ahead. <laughs> To get the the conversation started a little bit more, I, I think that there's some questions to answer around the Marine Planning Council member role. Um, and I ask the chair and the executive director, is that a discussion for here to then move forward to appointments? Or how would you like to deal with that? Um, I. I would like to continue making progress on the list of things we need to check off on this agenda item. Uh, in terms of appointments, I'm not sure. Are you talking about membership appointments on the agenda? On the... I'm talking about the Marine Planning Council member role okay. and the questions that have that, been raised around that. I think that appointment, well, let me turn to Merrick. I, I have my view on that. It would be taken up under membership appointments, but which is a different agenda item. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. That, that's consistent with my thinking as well, and that would give uh, the rest of the council staff and I some time to um, refresh our memories on this, uh, this particular appointment, for lack of a better word, and be better prepared tomorrow for this discussion. Uh, John Ugaritz. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I just was going to voice some support. I I don't see a reason to discontinue the role. I do think we should rename it so it's not specific to the one body that doesn't exist anymore. Um, I think there was some good discussion between Karin and Phil and I that really pins down the what that role should be and what it um, is not. Uh, and I think the motion that we just passed includes, you know, representation by that individual on, on the NPC discussion decisions about quick response letters. So um, I agree it can come up under membership appointments. I just wanted to get out the feeling that I think the discussion we had about it and how it acts today should be considered then. Excellent, thank you. So um, we have before us a number of additional items and I know that there's an additional motion. So I will call on Dr. Karen Braby. Yeah, thank you again in the interest of trying to move us forward. Um, Sandra has a second motion that I would be happy to offer at this time. 
I move that the council approve the following proposed actions with the included guidance. One, finalize the Oregon call area draft letter with strong collaboration with MPC, HC, and council staff to address input from ABs and public comment. Final approval by QR process. Two, create draft two of the policy guidance document. Consider comments from MPC, HC, and others raised thus far. Request review from EWG and EAS and bring back to Council in September 2022. This guidance document should be used as an OSW offshore wind specific uh, document and it should be edited to provide support at, for the Council's rapid response to comment opportunities rather than as a reference document. Three, NOAA AOAs prepare QR letter for council approval due July 22nd. Four, California proposed sale notice prepare QR letter for council approval due 8 1 2022. And five, BOEM fishery mitigation strategy guidance track and anticipate future QR letter opportunities. Thank you, Karin, for the motion. Is the language on the display accurate and complete? Uh, question for the maker of the motion. You want to do it before we have our, before we second it? Okay, go ahead. Sorry, Karin, when you read it, you said uh, support for the council's rapid response. Do you want to add the four there to that? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. All right. We have a motion on the screen uh, and it's accurate and complete per the maker of the motion. And yes. I'll look for a second, seconded by Phil Anderson. Please speak to your motion. So these five items um, can move forward. The, the additional items that um, Carrie has teed up for us for uh, uh, council discussion and decision-making today. Um, and this is just affirming that these um, five activities should move forward and, and that um, we as a council, um, by voting for this motion, would uh, agree with that path forward uh, and give some of the guidance that was requested uh, from the MPC on how that should happen. So, Thank you very much. Uh, questions for the maker of the motion? Discussion on the motion. Pete Hassemer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, not really discussion. I support this motion and thank Karen for tying this all together here in the one motion. Uh, this is getting ahead of the vote, but I just want to highlight should this pass that under item number two, I think it's important to take just a, a little bit of time before we close out this agenda item to uh, provide some guidance on what that document would be uh, that we want to see in September, maybe just to be a glib about it, that uh, be a little more specific about the rock we want to see at that time. Thank you. And, and you're okay with that doing that after this motion? Okay. Uh, further discussion on the motion? All right, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Karin, for helping us make some progress here. Uh, I'm going to instantly go to Pete Hossamer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I want to express my appreciation to the group that put together this draft document. Um, I'm referencing, I, I should make sure it's attachment to the draft guidance document. Um, we gave some pretty general direction in March to take two documents, uh, meld them together and bring it back to us. And we have that looking through it. Uh, I think it's, it's a, a good start on where we want to be. We have some specific comments uh, from both the Marine Planning Committee and the Habitat Committee. Um, this motion, I, I appreciate the reference in there that we're really looking at an, an inward facing document, something to help us on the QR process. 
So um, I'm not going to edit on the floor, but maybe provide some general observations relative to the comments we we received. Um, first of all, the Marine Planning Committee, their first comment uh, offers a rewrite of the purpose of that statement. Um, I, I I appreciate that, but as I read it, I think it it's more of an outward facing purpose than what we're trying to achieve. So I just ask the group to you know, look carefully at that. The purpose that's in our draft document is quite good. I, I would mention that the second, there's only two sentences there. The second sentence in that document, I think could be deleted. Um, it talks about um, guidance on expectations of other agencies, and and I, I don't think that's meeting our purpose of an inward looking document, but I could be wrong, so just look carefully. The second section on there is objectives in both the Marine Planning Committee and the Habitat Committee had some comments relative to that. Um, also earlier in in our discussion on this entire topic, um, we heard um, a statement um, from Joe Oatman about the tribal fisheries and the impacts to them. Um, my suggestion here is um, going back again to the earlier part of our discussion early on, uh, Phil had some made some excellent statements and if uh, if I could be so bold as to use his words, he referred to them as uh, Phil's measuring sticks or goalposts for our responsibility. And I think in this document, uh, again, those were excellent words and I'm not gonna try and repeat them here. So I only suggest go back, rewind the tape and listen to that and see if those statements better fit what we're trying to fit in this section of the document. Um, part of what he stated did talk about healthy fisheries. And so in, in addition to what the statements he made, think about fishing communities and incorporating that language as necessary. Um, if you need some guidance there, go back to our fishery ecosystem plan. We talk about healthy fishing communities. I offer that because these projects are very much site-based or place-based and their impacts are likely to be very localized. So we need to make sure that we focus also on the fishing communities. Um, one other comment, when you read the um, comments from the uh, MPC, I think they talk about references to recreational fisheries, so that's important. But again, we have commercial, we have recreational, and we have tribal fisheries and, and Joe made some comments to that. So think about how you capture all of those fisheries. And so again, I'll just refer to the excellent uh, words we had from Phil earlier on that. The remainder of the comments in both the MPC and the Habitat Committee, um, I just suggest you look carefully at those. They seem to get into a lot of detail and specificity and you gauge whether or not it's necessary in this guidance document to get that type of detail. What they identify there is very important to what we're doing, but with respect to a guidance document and the purpose, do we need all that detail in a prescriptive checklist or is it captured in other parts already or, or can you more generally state that? So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that completes my guidance on that. All right, thank you very much. Let me first see if there is any disagreement with the points that Pete raised. And then let me turn to our staff officer to make sure that those were captured. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Hasmer, yes. Um, I uh, madly wrote down um, Pete's um, words and I think I, captured the gist of what he was saying. Um, you put several uh, sort of themes in there, but I think I got those and we can touch bases afterwards if you want. Um, you're right, there, there are a lot of comments by now, um, either in writing or informally here on the floor, um, but um, I'm happy to work with 
um, you know, you and the MPC and the Habitat Committee and um, the EWG and the EAS on getting a new version of that document for council review. So I think I got that. All right, thanks. And as Pete mentioned, there's always the tape. So yeah. uh, is there further input uh, on any of these actions before us? Is there anything, oh, Karen Braby. Just flagging, there was a suggestion from uh, the MPC on um, scheduling this agenda item. I know that's a workload planning issue, but just something that we should anticipate talking about tomorrow. Indeed. Anything further for the good of this agenda item? All right. Mr. Griffin. All right, thank you. Um, that was long, but that was good. Um, I appreciate all the discussion and guidance. I, I think I think that the motions uh, offered were very thoughtful and give us some clarity and some direction um, without turning the whole um, you know Marine Planning Committee process upside down. I think it'll help us um, you know sort of hone our skills. Um, as we move forward, we'll get to work on uh, these several uh, tasks at hand. The first one up is going to be the Oregon call areas letter. And I just want to flag that this is going to be a real short turnaround time now. So um, we'll get a, a, a um, we'll get a version done. My goal is within a couple of days for a quick review round from the um, advisory body crew and then out to the council for, as part of the QR process. So that would be probably early next week. I think that at least is next Monday, the 20th. Yeah, I think that's a holiday now, at least in some or most states. And so that's that's a day lost there. But um, uh, anyway, mostly I just wanted to flag that the please be ready council members for, a, you know, probably maybe less than a one week QR process, but you've all seen it. and. You know, you've seen the draft letter and you're pretty familiar with what's in there. So um, so that's coming next. And then several other, um, you know, letters and uh, meetings and whatnot. So I guess that's all I have. I think you've accomplished your business for this uh, agenda item. All right. Thank you, everyone. It's almost 530. I don't think we're going to take up. We're not going to move up any more agenda items. Uh, Merrick, do you have any announcements? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, nice work, everyone, today. Um, I believe this is the longest day on the council floor since I began my tenure, so not too bad. Uh, a little past 530. Uh, let's see, looking ahead to tomorrow, um, I would point you to um, a couple of things. One is uh, Mike has been working in the background very diligently at uh, developing some new year to glance and uh, draft September uh, schedules for us to look at. Included on there is the question of marine planning coming back in September that Ms. Bravey just raised. Um, so please take a look at that uh, in anticipation of tomorrow. Um, and then tomorrow we also have um, uh, membership appointments and things of that nature. And we will take a look at some of the questions that were raised here this evening um, in anticipation of that item. So. That's what's in front of us tomorrow. Um, happy to answer any more questions, Mr. Chairman. Otherwise, that's all that I have. All right. I don't see any other hands, so thanks, everyone. Have uh, Enjoy your last evening here in the Vancouver Hilton. Until the next time we're here, and uh, we'll see everyone in the morning. <laughs>